watching the recording. It is currently 546 p.m. Uh, so you can jump forward to the 14 minute mark. I know when he was watching this and just watching me redo my hair every couple minutes. I'm fine with that.
Sorry about that, Lizzie, you have your volume on. It was my dryer. I'm going to turn it off in a minute. Pretty great sound effect. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it's six o'clock. Um, if you have the capacity to turn on your camera, this is your reminder to turn that on because it does help me. Um, so, I think it feels good to take a look at the syllabus, so that's what I'm gonna do right now. Why does this voice sound so low? Yeah, what? Oh. So just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Hope everything's going okay in your world and all that stuff. My house smells like cabbage, but that's because I was cooking. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. Uh, so you should just see my Microsoft Word right now. Um, So this makes us week five economics. Uh, we are having our live lecture right now. Uh, we are on, I don't know if that, no, sorry about that. We're on week five right now. You should have read chapter six for this week. If you haven't read it up to this point, please read chapter six. Um,
Um, your essay for this week is uh, Apocalypse Economy. Basically what you're doing is uh, 500 words. You can't lay the whole damn thing out in 500 words, but in 500 words, lay out like a kind of economy you would do after the world, right? So tell me what would that look like? Um, how would uh, that work out? Um, what would you do? Uh, you don't have to go into excruciating detail. You can get a little bit creative there. Uh, the key with that is to just show me you understand the material at hand. Show me you understand what an economy is. Show me you understand how economies work and uh, all that fun stuff. Um, then next week we'll be doing a choose your own utopia type exercise. And then after that we have week seven and then week eight is our midterm. So we're three weeks out from the midterm, which is just kind of something I wanted to see. Um, are there, uh, while I'm getting my windows lined up uh, properly, are there any questions? I have to go. Anyone have any questions? I don't see anyone with pressing questions. That's good, probably. So let me get things rolling. 45. Just a reminder, we want to have our mics off, but cameras on. Okay, that's as good as I'm gonna get for getting lined up. So that's just fine. Um, so uh, does everyone uh, see the economics lecture right now? That's what you see? Very good. Okay, so this is, and I was uh, sitting around today doing my uh, during the day stay at home dad stuff. Uh, this really is uh, one of my favorite topics, and it sounds super boring, uh, and it, I, I don't know, um, but, and I was thinking, why is this one of my favorite topics? Because this topic is about work. Uh, this topic and work is actually something I specialized in uh, when I was in graduate school. Uh, what are the things that people do for a living? What are the things that people in our neighborhood are up to, right? When they're not sitting around eating hot dogs in the backyard, well, what are people's jobs? That's something that's interesting to me. And um, so when you think about economies and economics in terms of this course, don't think about um, checkbooks or your bank account or stock market stuff, really what we're talking about is jobs, right? And the types of jobs that people do uh, in their lives. Um, so that is really uh, what we're all about when we talk about economies and economics uh, from either a sociological or an anthropological perspective. Um, so first we're gonna talk about pre-modern economies, then we will transition into talking about modern economies. Um, and then we will look at our culture of the week when we're done talking about individual economies. Um, this week's culture of the week is a uh, First Nations tribe in Canada. Um, I was mulling over how exactly to deal with this one because um, I, this isn't uh, a culture I'm... I'm super well versed in. It's just super interesting and they engage in the uh, economic activity known as potlatch, which is super different than um, 
than a lot of things that are present in uh, our economy as such. Uh, let me grab the waiting room for a second, guys. Um, so that's something we, so the potlatch culture I did want to talk about, but I also wanted to talk about the culture uh, of that group, but I didn't want to just mess it up by not super knowing what I'm talking about. Uh, the short of that is saying, uh, we are going to be watching a little bit of a documentary at the end of this class today. Um, if we have the same kind of uh, debacle that we had with our sociology movie night, uh, I have uh, posted the link to that in the PowerPoints too, that you should be able to watch it with, but we only have right now 27 people here, so it shouldn't be as much of a problem. With that said, Central Ohio is having just wild connectivity issues. I'm sure most of us are aware of that, uh, so it's always good to have a backup. Anyway, so let's get going in on this thing. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, economics are more than just how money is managed. Uh, the better definition of economics is the study of how societies use its scarce resources to produce and distribute goods and services. Uh, so, uh, when we talk about resources, we're talking about things that are limited in some way. Uh, some resources are far more scarce than other resources. Uh, gold, uh, coal, gold and diamonds are thought to be super scarce. They're actually artificially scarce, but that's beside the point. Uh, things like water, things like food, things like trees, basically anything that you can buy and sell uh, falls into that category of quote unquote scarce resources. Um, yeah, it's, it, that's one of those terms that if you start thinking too hard about it, you'll just kind of mess yourself up and start thinking, well, is love a scarce resource? Something wild like that. Just don't think too hard about it. You'll be fine. Um, economists also analyze uh, choices people make regarding uh, goods and services. So what will make someone buy something over another thing? That isn't really something that uh, sociologists and anthropologists look at. Uh, but that, that's actually a big portion of what economists look at, though, is what motivates people to purchase something or to expend money, whatever. Um, an economic system, then, is the patterned way in which people produce, distribute, and consume goods and services. Uh, variations in this regard uh, include available resources. So if you are a society uh, like Greece that has a massive amount of your border uh, bordering the sea, right, then obviously your economy is going to include a lot of fish, right? Uh, if you are a highly advanced technological society, technological development, then you are probably gonna deal with a whole lot more computer stuff than say, um, just thinking, Bangladesh. Bangladesh doesn't have that much in terms of uh, IT infrastructure, for example. And then also prevalent uh, philosophies and ideologies. So the perspectives of people in societies also can uh, determine what their economies uh, look like. If you have, uh, for example, a high uh, percentage of uh, your population is uh, devout Buddhists, for example, then you might not have a lot of um, gun sales in your economy uh, because uh, there is a belief uh, within Buddhism that it, it is unethical to be a weapons dealer. Right, and so people wouldn't necessarily believe make that their job. Uh, so that could also impact your economy. Um, layer into that uh, when we talk about more modern economies in a bit, uh, socialism and capitalism. Those uh, ideologies or philosophies or whatever you want to call them really played a huge part in uh, how economies worked in um, the 20th century and also to a degree in our modern economy, uh, but it's not quite what it was in the 1900s. So 
Uh, the tradition, now this is, this slide is a big piece of a disclaimer because, well, I have to explain it, I'll read it. Uh, the traditional linear model for understanding economic systems is somewhat ethnocentric. It straight up is, right? So, uh, and this is a model I will blame on anthropologists. Um, the model is set up as such, and you'll see this as we go through today's lecture, because I based my lecture on that model, because it's a useful model, but it makes it look like that hunter-gatherers are inherently not as good as uh, agriculturalists, and then agriculturalists aren't as good as modern technological societies. I'm not implying that in any way. It's just different, and especially in the modern era, societies and people who choose to live in hunter-gatherer societies today, they are making that choice, right? Our society, our globe is intensely interconnected, right? And there are many young people that grow up in hunter-gatherer societies, but then decide to move to a different society. No, given it's not entirely a free choice, right? If you can't access those resources, you can't just up and move to England or whatever. But it is, there is an element to that there. Um, and that, that's interesting to think about. Uh, with that said, one of the major reasons I, I keep teaching and talking about this model is because it is super helpful for catalog, cataloging uh, societies that currently exist in our world, and also uh, past societies as uh, the way the United States used to be, the way European societies used to be, the way many societies around the globe used to be. Um, so it's good for understanding both the modern and uh, the old, uh, but I'm not implying that, uh, you know, technological societies are inherently better than pastoral societies or whatever. Um, yeah, and, and then those conversations are completely, completely valid. So uh, let's start back at the beginning uh, of humans with the hunter-gatherer society. Uh, hunter-gatherer societies uh, started in 350 uh, 100,000 years ago, right? Uh, 350,000 BC, right? Uh, which would be uh, 352,000 years ago. Um, note uh, for the remainder of this lecture that I'm going to give these dates right here. These dates are approximate. You don't really feel the approximateness of it until we get up into the modern day and I draw the line between modern and postmodern, but these are very approximate dates. The transition between technological modes of economies doesn't just happen overnight. It is a slow uh, progression and some of those progressions took thousands of years to actually take. Uh, so in hunter-gatherer societies, everyone gathers their needs from the environment, from the resources in the environment in one way or another. Uh, thus, accumulation of wealth is largely not possible because most products are perishable, right? We don't have the vast majority of things that hunter-gatherers had because the things that they produce were made out of natural fibers, they were made out of plant materials and animal, to animal materials, and if those things get lost, they get forgotten about whatever, uh, they rot, right? Or if they're included in a tomb, they rot. They didn't produce things that kept going forever uh, other than uh, spearheads and some pottery. Um, so pretty fragile stuff. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our society, uh, when uh, it starts to be dug up for uh, archaeological reasons, uh, they're going to know all about how we live our lives because we're leaving a bunch of garbage um, that doesn't go anywhere, which is a bright and sunny disposition. Uh, so here we have um, a uh, image of a hunter-gatherer uh, society currently uh, in Africa. And here is a depiction 
of a hunter-gatherer society uh, in a more of a European region. Uh, it's a common misconception that we don't have, um, well, it's actually, we don't really have hunter-gatherers in uh, Europe anymore. There are pastoralists. We'll, we'll address that and talk about that. So, in terms of hierarchy in hunter-gatherer societies, uh, they tend to be relatively unstratified. Let's define that word. Stratification is the condition of some people having more power or resources than others, right? Uh, so uh, hunter-gatherer societies are relatively all equal. Everyone's more or less effectively the same because uh, there's not stuff you can keep, right? Uh, everything that could be considered wealth that people had eventually rotted or went, went away eventually. There was pro some stratification, a little bit of stratification, but you really couldn't accumulate wealth in a way that would make you super rich for forever or especially your family rich for a super long time. That kind of thing was just, un it wasn't possible. Um, through these economies, uh, this is just something I became interested in through this lecture, and I never really talked about it uh, in terms of, because um, I always I teach about this in my sociology class all the time. This is, a, this is a topic I talk about a lot about. I decided to include a bit about slavery in there uh, because it is a point of interest in uh, history how it impacts us in the modern day, and what slavery has looked like through the ages. So there was some hunter-gatherer slavery uh, that occurred when hunter-gatherer societies engaged in raids and small-scale warfare, right? So what war looked like in these societies is effectively they would um, do these raids and they would try to grab some resources from an adjacent uh, tribe or clan and uh, basically take some of their stuff. And then sometimes the stuff that they took uh, would be people too. Uh, this is a very, very old human behavior. Uh, this raiding type behavior uh, was seen in the, in the uh, Plains Indians in uh, the 18, up until even the 1870s. That's not right. I think it was done by then. Anyway, we saw it among the Plains Indians. Uh, we saw it uh, all kinds of societies globally. We also see it in um, some uh, primates as well. So this is a pretty deeply ingrained uh, thing. So slaves were taken as uh, captives, but there was no racial component to slavery there. We'll talk about how race and slavery came into being later on, but that isn't how s slavery was done for the vast majority of human societies. And I am by no means saying that slavery is ever good. Um, just putting it into context. Slavery is always horrible. Um, gender equality. So in hunter-gatherer societies, gender equality was high, right? Men and women were uh, seen as equals and as working together. And actually in hunter-gatherer societies, uh, women sometimes came to being of elevated status uh, when compared to men. Um, women were typically gatherers. They were typically the ones that went out into the wilderness and found food that could be eaten. Men were more often hunters. Uh, this is, it's a common uh, perception of how it worked and it is actually how it actually happened. There are some misconceptions though about how hunter-gatherer societies worked. Uh, so as I mentioned, women were often of higher status than men. Why would that be? Well, women gave birth, right? Uh, birth means more people. More people means that your settlement has a better chance of surviving, that the group has a better chance of surviving. Additionally, because women were gatherers, then they were producing the majority of the food, 
right? Because gatherers in the hunter-gatherer society were the ones that pulled in most of the food. Uh, hunting was uh, an unreliable way to get food. It was the minority of food. Uh, meat for these societies did provide absolutely critical nutrients uh, there are certain things in meat, especially in societies that can't, that aren't advanced farming societies that can't produce things like uh, soybeans and iron rich foods uh, naturally. Uh, hunting is super critical for those societies, um, but it isn't a d everyday thing. Um, and it's interesting, uh, some have hypothesized, some uh, social scientists have hypothesized that men were often designated as the hunters because uh, when it comes to biology, us men are more uh, uh, expendable, right? To make more humans, you don't need, you only need one or two men to make a whole lot more humans. Uh, women, on the other hand, uh, we need you uh, to stay around to be able to give birth. Uh, and that sort of logic may have been uh, more obviously present in a lot of these societies. Here we have uh, the Venus of Willendorf, uh, which is uh, the, 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 specifically the Venus of Willendorf is this one, uh, this uh, earth mother goddess or more accurately, mother goddess. We don't know the exact beliefs of the people that made these. Uh, these goddesses uh, were typical uh, and thought to be relatively common uh, in uh, Europe and adjacent areas, uh, maybe down into uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa, uh, near Asia. Uh, these uh, could have been found. Um, we are not so sure what this thing was actually for. Uh, the popular conception is uh, that it is uh, some kind of goddess, right? Uh, it, um, it is made out of stone, so that's why we have it, right? Uh, they probably did also make these out of wood, but eventually they rotted and disappeared. Um, these are, were, have been found on travelers. Uh, they are made of stone. Uh, so a lot of effort had to be put into creating it too. So whatever these things actually are, it says to us that they were super, super important to the people that had them, right? This depiction of uh, the female figure, which, which also means that they, they put importance on women. Um, very interesting. It's so interesting to look at ancient artifacts because it gives us an opportunity to see something that people from 20,000 years ago, 22,000 years ago, that they also saw too. Uh, Willendorf, yeah, is in Austria, uh, by the way. Anyway, moving on. Third genders, uh, also have been documented in hunter-gatherer societies and later, uh, which is pretty interesting. We, te we tend to think that our modern conceptions of gender are new things, and they really aren't. Um, so define that term third gender. A third gender is defined as a general term, general anthropological term for people who did not fall into strict gender binary categories but were accepted and or celebrated uh, among the society. Uh, the term third gender describes a really super wide spectrum of LGBT plus people. Um, it, it just goes across the board, uh, third gendered people. Uh, some societies identi identified third gendered individuals to having special positions. Some did, some didn't, right? Um, so uh, here we have a, a picture of a, a Navajo individual. I don't know uh, what their preferred pronouns would be, uh, but this Nav Navajo individual uh, is uh, depicted uh, with uh, the ceremonial tobacco pipe in addition to 
uh, this jewelry uh, signifies them as being uh, a shaman, right? And this is, this makes sense in terms of uh, religious and magical practices globally that that in-between space, what's sometimes called liminal or liminality, uh, that is a big concept um, in magical practices. And it, it makes sense that those societies, because remember in a lot of these societies too, you don't get to choose what you be when you grow up, right? You are whatever your, your collective needs you to be, right? So if we need a shaman and the religious laws prefer uh, third gendered people to be shamans, then um, we have them do that. It tells us that, again, I'm, I'm big on like reading into it. What does that tell us about the society? This tells us that those va societies valued third gendered individuals, right? They didn't think they were bad. They didn't think they were inferior. If anything, they thought that they were special. Um, in pan Indian communities, as in Native American, uh, the term two spirited is often used for three gendered, uh, for third gendered individuals. Um, that is a term used in uh, the, the among Native American tribes. Uh, and then sometimes individual tribes had their own terms. Uh, it's, it, it's super interesting stuff. Any questions or comments there? That makes sense? Really what a lot of this shows us is that, you know, um, sexuality has always been fluid. It's not a new development. And I find that super duper interesting. Okay. I also find doggies interesting. Um, Hunter-gatherer societies uh, were likely domestic, dogs were likely domesticated uh, during the hunter-gatherer period. Uh, dogs uh, were helpful in hunting and guarding settlements, and we still use dogs for these reasons, right? And if you know anything about dogs or dog breeding, you know that dogs actually Dogs were technology, right? They were bred for very specific reasons and purposes. Uh, even those, there's a reason why small dogs tend to be yippy and tend to be super loud. Uh, many of those breeds were specifically bred not only to be small, but to be loud because those breeds were effectively bred as uh, security systems, as alarm systems. Uh, right? Uh, so if the dog couldn't like actually uh, be vicious and kill something, at least they can warn us that something is coming. Um, the vast majority of, uh, I think there, there are exceptions to this. I know that, but uh, the majority of dogs did come from uh, the gray wolf, which is their common ancestor. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, chihuahuas have a, uh, a different ancestor. Uh, chihuahuas, I, know, I used to have a chihuahua, um, they actually, it is amazing, and I love to think about this, uh, in the state of Chihuahua in northern Mexico, there actually are bands of wild chihuahuas running around, uh, like completely taking care of themselves. Uh, apparently, they're intensely vicious, too, because, uh, like, they're little packs of ferocious little dogs. I just love that image of wild little dogs running around. So, uh, horticultural and pastoral societies. Here, I, this is my term I used for this presentation. This isn't an official thing, but it's to understand how horticulture and pastoral societies worked. Uh, I like to think of them as hunter-gatherer plus, right? They were very much and are very much like hunter-gatherer societies, but they have an extra buffer of an extra food source, right? Uh, your society would be, in all likelihood, either horticulturalist or pastoralists. Societies didn't really do both, right? Uh, they, they tended to do one or the other. Uh, so horticultural societies uh, were people that gather from the environment, but they also engage in small-scale farming, similar to uh, large gardens, 
right? Uh, and that's in the modern day too, is how we define uh, horticulture is in uh, using a relatively small amount of land, not digging too deep into the earth, um, and then uh, food is consumed as it is produced, thus there is a limited ac accumulation. Just like in uh, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, with, am I getting ahead of myself? No, just like in hunter-gatherer societies, um, there is a pretty low degree of hierarchy, a low degree of richness an individual could have uh, because it was very much a collective kind of thing. Here we have a picture of a Maori village. Uh, if you're not super familiar with the Maori, uh, think um, Moana, right? Uh, from the Disney movie a couple years ago. If you're familiar with that, you know little kids. Uh, Moana uh, was actually a pretty good depiction of the Maoris. Uh, here you would see this would be the fields that they used to farm, and then here would be another little field, and then these areas surrounded by fencing uh, would be uh, living areas, and there's one up here. And then of course the Maori also, uh, they uh, did fishing expeditions as well, and fishing was important to them, but uh, most of the food they got came uh, from their little farming operations. Then, uh, pastoral societies, and I've mentioned the Maasai before. Uh, pastoral societies, uh, people gather from the environment, uh, but they also herd animals, right? So most of their, a good portion of their food uh, comes from the animals that they herd. Uh, these animals, do, uh, actually there's a donkey right here too. Uh, so uh, it isn't only one animal. I, I like how that propped up there. Um, there, uh, you would, do, but you would specialize, right? You're a sheep, a sheep herder, uh, would specialize in sheep, uh, every once in, I know this because a friend of mine has sheep, uh, every once in a while a goat just kind of shows up, uh, which is, a that's a weird story. That's his story, not mine. Um, but goats and sheep, they can hang out together, right? Uh, but mostly you'd be a sheep kind of guy. Um, something else I was going to say. Oh, uh, so it's super interesting uh, if you uh, are of a, one, a, a religious background of one of the Abrahamic religions. Um, I can't see who needs to, someone's having trouble with muting right now. Um, oh. There, I'll help with that. Kids are hard. Okay. Um, so, uh, the Abrahamic religions, so Christianity, Judaism, Islam, all of those stories from those societies, the vast majority of those stories are of people living in pastoral societies, right? So, and that's, that's an interesting perspective to take. And that's why, uh, for example, in the New Testament and Christianity, uh, they're always talking about sheep and goats and how goats uh, how you don't want to be a goat, but you want to be like a sheep. Well, that doesn't make any sense to us in a modern sense if you're separated from the religion. But if you're in that society, in the pastoral setting, that tells you you should be like a sheep because sheep go along with everyone else. You don't want to be like a goat. Goats are assholes, right? I know that because I grew up in the country. Goats can be real jerks, right? So that lesson is be, be, don't be like a goat. Don't be a real jerk, right? And then also uh, in uh, the New Testament, you also see all these illusions about fishing and all that because he was. they were talking to people who were uh, fishing kind of people. Um, if a society were to evolve in the modern era, those illusions, those, those uh, religious stories may be more about computers or maybe more about technology and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so moving on. As I mentioned, uh, just go over this again, uh, hierarchy is pretty low in hunter-gather, in horticultural and pastoral societies as well, namely because as people make stuff, they use it up, 
right? You are right now, you're wearing clothes, you're using up your clothes because you're putting a little bit of wear on it, it'll go away, right? Um, and that, that is largely uh, the case in uh, these societies as well. We don't really see accumulation of stuff and uh, those kind of disparities until uh, we get, um, until we get to agricultural type societies. Uh, similarly, along the lines of talking about slave labor, uh, there were um, some slaves in hunter-gatherer societies, and the reason those slaves would be present is because they were captured uh, similarly to a set, the raiding setting that occurred in hunter-gatherer societies. Agricultural societies. This is the big point where humanity diverged from the rest of the world, really. Um, so 10,000 BC in the agricultural economic era continued from 10,000 BC to 1750 AD, right? There's a couple points with that right there. I'm gonna skim back, sorry. I know some of you are taking notes. I see that, that's great. Uh, but see that 10,000 to 1750? That sounds like a super long time, but look at this. Hunter-gatherers were 350,000 to 18,000, right? That is the vast majority of our existence as a species, right? If it, it's not super large, logical to make arguments about the natural state of humanity. I mean, some interesting points can be made, but if you're going to argue about what's natural among humans, this is really what we are evolution-wise lined up to be, is to be the, the, in these societies. Anyway, though, um, but we're agriculturalists for a very long time. Uh, at some point, uh, and this illustration I, I think is super useful, that's why I included it. Um, these orange dots are the oldest evidence we have of farming globally, right? Uh, now, contrary to what, uh, you know, ancient astronaut people would want you to believe, uh, these are not all connected, right? These are individual peoples, some people in uh, what, what's known as the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, which is in uh, modern day uh, Iran and Iraq. These people figured out how to farm, right? but also these people over in Mesoamerica figured out how to farm. And then people over here uh, in the Yellow River Valley figured out how to farm. And then we have people in New Guinea who figured out how to farm. And then a couple thousand years later, we have people in Africa who, who got it right. And then uh, much later on, well, 6,000 years later, which is a long time, uh, the Hopewell Society figured it out. Uh, if you don't know anything about the Hopewell uh, Society, uh, they're super, super interesting. Uh, this is a group of Native Americans that were long extinct before um, white people got here, right? They, they were long, long, long gone. Uh, the only, and Hopewell was not the name for them. Hopewell was the name of the white dude that discovered them. Uh, we don't know what they called themselves. Uh, but we do know that they were dominant in, in this area of the United States. We don't know why they disappeared. Uh, the best evidence is that uh, it was some kind of uh, massive crop failure, but we really don't know why they fell apart. Uh, the vast, if you, uh, you're familiar uh, with uh, Ohio in a tourism way, uh, all of the earth mounds uh, or the vast majority of them, including Serpent Mound, uh, were built by the Hopewell Society, a super duper interesting society. And they were also agriculturalists too. That's what we're gonna be talking about in the next couple slides, the agriculturalists. So all these societies around 10,000 BC, uh, uh, ranging from 10,000 to about 5,000, over this 5,000 year period, they figured out how to be agriculturalists. They figured out how to grow scale 
food on a massive scale. And now let's talk about how that's different from something like horticulture. So agricultural societies are made possible by the plow. The plow sounds silly to us as not agriculturalists, but the plow is what makes agriculture possible. So um, plows grant uh, farmers access to nutrients that are deeper in soil. So uh, the blade goes down into the soil and it pulls behind an animal or it could be a person. Uh, animals are far, far more common to be used with plows, namely, and this guy looks like he's having a tough time too, uh, namely because um, animals can do it a whole lot better because, you know, an ox is much stronger than a human. Um, it would be pulled behind the ox and uh, you could make, make a much, much bigger amount of land usable much, much faster. I don't know if any of you have ever tried uh, or helped make a garden from scratch, right? Not just do the same, there's a reason why people don't move around their gardens. I don't know if you do any gardening, it's because it's really, really hard work to move a garden or to start a new garden. It's in Ohio, you have to dig into the dirt, you have to pull up the topsoil and the turf, you have to pull up the turf, you need to get rid of all those grass vines and what's called sod, and it's, it's in, incredibly labor intensive, right? Uh, if you're sitting in an area about the size of where I'm sitting, uh, your standard room in a house, right? That takes a couple hours, that would take a couple hours to prepare, um, to make it um, usable in a gardening sense. But with a plow, in that same amount of time, you can make 10 times as much land usable, right? So much, much, much faster. Additionally, you get those nutrients, you get deeper into the soil, which makes uh, more water available, uh, which kicks up uh, more of those bugs that help plants grow, all kinds of really, it, and it, it makes your society, your farming, your gardening dramatically more uh, profitable, right? Um, mm, 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 mm. Yes, and Human pulled plows uh, are not unheard of, but uh, common. And plows were used uh, in Asian societies, in European societies, in uh, Middle Eastern societies, every in, in Mesoamerican societies, every society that has a tradition of large scale agriculture uh, has plows. This is super interesting to me too. Um, so selective breeding is also technology, right? Many of the vegetables that we take for granted today were developed over hundreds of years by careful selected breeding. So this plant, uh, which uh, grows wild, I believe it is a, a an, I, I do apologize, this uh, whole lecture is pretty darn Eurocentric. Uh, it's largely because that's that's the um, the gardening styles I know uh, is what it comes down to. So this plant, uh, this uh, European native plant, uh, is the descendant of cabbage, of Brussels sprouts, of kohlrabi, of kale, of broccoli, and of cauliflower. All of those these modern vegetables do not grow in nature. There's no such thing as wild broccoli uh, in that sort of sense, right? Kale just didn't develop without humans. Uh, and even if you do find wild broccoli, it's because it kind of escaped and got out on its own. Uh, so uh, this kind of selective plant breeding too is something that took off after uh, the agricultural revolution. And that's a distinct advantage that societies that engaged in agriculture had is they had better plants, they had better food, they had better fed people, 
right? And if you're talking about something like warfare, that then allows your society with the better fed people to go in and take over uh, among those people that weren't as well fed. Um, increased production is, as I mentioned, uh, is the major advantage uh, of the agricultural society. Uh, and it also means that not everyone has to be a farmer, right? Uh, in previous societies, in uh, pastoral societies, horticultural societies, hunter-gatherer societies, those societies had to put most of their work into, um, into feeding themselves, right? But if you only have to have 90% of your population doing that work, as opposed to 100%, then you have an extra 10% worth of people to become craftspeople, to become warriors, to become priests, to become royalty. And then those innovations changed inherently the society that people were living in, in really super uh, big ways. Uh, I have this uh, headpiece uh, from a sarcophagus. Uh, I believe this is one of Tutankhamen's um, sarcophagi lids. Uh, but this kind of uh, note, this is, this is plate gold, right? This is an amazing amount of artistry, right? There have to be, had to have been people that dedicated their lives to this kind of craftsmanship. Uh, and that's not saying anything about uh, the mummification craftsmanship process, too. This isn't something that could be made by somebody that had to go back and take care of the farm later on that day, right? This had to be like somebody's full-time job. So, uh, so those agricultural societies, they developed craftspeople. So people like shoemakers, weavers, potters, and blacksmiths, right? And if you can dedicate yourself to that kind of uh, craft, then you can get better and better and better at it, right? If you make shoes all day, every day, you're going to be a lot better at making shoes as opposed to somebody that makes a new pair of shoes every uh, couple years when you need a new pair of shoes, right? You'll, it'll be better shoes. Um, also, uh, it allows for technological advancement in specific fields. So if you can dedicate yourself to being a blacksmith, you can, for every hundred or thousand blacksmiths, there will be one that figures out, oh, hey, if I mix tin with copper, I get this new metal, bronze. And bronze is much harder and easier to, but easier to work with than either tin or copper. Hey, that's a major technological advancement, right? And that would make stronger plows. It would make stronger weapons, all that sort of thing. Um, and, it, and then uh, stonemasons uh, specializing allow buildings to get much more large and much more complex. And then though uh, the innovations of blacksmiths helped stonemasons uh, make their stuff even bigger and bigger, right? Uh, so really uh, in the agricultural society uh, stage, sorry, that was me thinking, not your computer freezing. In that stage, uh, you get this kind of uh, synergy between people and in society that like interconnects and interlocks in very interesting ways. Uh, anything I missed here? No. Um, warriors. Now, uh, regardless of how you feel about warfare in the modern or ancient sense, there definitely was a high degree of energy spent on warfare today and in the previous eras. Now, war often required, well, it doesn't as much in the modern era, but sometimes did, uh, requires a conscription of common people. But the presence of professional warriors add a distinct advantage of a military force. What does that mean? That means an agricultural society would 
uh, really be, be able to dominate a hunter-gatherer or horticultural society is what that means. Uh, it's a absolutely distinct advantage. Uh, so, uh, for example, in our pictures here, uh, we have, I, I just looked around, uh, it's a relatively accurate depiction of what it would be. Roman legionnaires who were a professional fighting force, uh, fighting uh, what were probably Celtic barbarians. Celtic people are those people uh, from, well, in the ancient sense, from France, from uh, Eastern Germany. But the Celtic people, they were farmers. And then when they needed warriors, they said, okay, guys, let's come be warriors too. They knew, their warriors knew how to fight, right? But the professional soldiers practiced fighting all day, every day. They honed that strategy. They knew how to communicate through like grunts and whistles and yells that were more advanced than uh, the people they were fighting. Uh, similarly, uh, in depictions of uh, war chariots uh, from ancient Egypt, you see things that would have required a great deal of training, right? And many of these depictions have uh, images of two-person chariots. Some are one-person chariots. Uh, the one-person chariot is actually the more advanced version of it uh, because you had to have a more steady chariot, technologically advanced, better metallurgy. Uh, we also see a, a professional um, archer right here, in addition to the archer that is uh, ar ar behind uh, the horse. Uh, it shows uh, the barding on the horse is relatively uh, elaborate, right? And of course, this isn't like a, a, a uh, technological blueprint, right? It's just what people are depicting, but it's showing what was in present in society. I'm really super curious. Uh, I was looking in these pictures, and a lot of them involve uh, cheetahs and large cats. I don't know if this is depicting that wow, check out how fast these chariots were, that there's also a cheetah right there. Or maybe in ancient Egypt, they were actually like breeding cheetahs for war animals. I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's not really my area of expertise. Uh, and then this uh, silly little cartoon uh, that says, the sword is cool, aren't that, but aren't we fighting guys with armor made of this stuff? Uh, I hope they feed us. Uh, the food that we grow. I don't know who's going to grow the food while we're off fighting. Um, this is to emphasize that in those ancient, uh, in that ancient warfare, a significant portion of the fighting forces were conscripts, right? They were just everyday people that they threw a spear at and they say, here, you're in the army now, right? That was a thing. But in those societies, uh, basically, if you were stuck being a conscript, you really were a completely expendable, right? Uh, they didn't care if you lived or died, but there were also these elite fighting forces that made that difference there. Um, and that all came into play in uh, how societies interacted with each other. So priests, uh, I think I cut out the slide on royalty because this priest and royalty thing really interconnects. Uh, so in agricultural societies, we tend to see more complex religion and with basically a greater hierarchy of religious beliefs, uh, more uh, religious books, for example, a more educated priest class. That's because, remember, the priest gets to be a full-time priest, as opposed to previous societies when they just had to kind of be amateurs. Uh, so uh, the religion uh, upticks in complexity. Uh, additionally, priest classes in the areas where they first developed were often the ones that developed writing and literacy uh, first, right? Uh, because they had to remember and record those things 
the, about the religion itself and to be able to communicate with each other. Now, did they share that information with the public at large or was learning how to read and write a secret thing? Uh, that depended from society to society. Uh, there were definitely store. There are definitely were societies that kept reading and writing a uh, secret for a long, long time. We saw that in medieval Europe. Actually, is uh, the uh, the church uh, did not let common people learn how to read and write, and they used it for that way. Um, additionally, religion can be used to reinforce governments. Uh, they. Um, they use ideas such as divine right, where in many society, agricultural societies, they develop these concepts that the king is the king because uh, God or the gods have ordained him to be king for forever. And why is he in charge? Well, because God said he should be in charge or some societies said because he is a god, right? Uh, this is a depiction of uh, the Aztec, uh, I, I believe the translation is king. Uh, this would be the kingly uh, character here. Here would be priests. Uh, these may have been servants or they may, may have been a special uh, caste, uh, but the priests and the religion were a big part of building up uh, the Aztec Empire. Now, the Aztecs are super interesting. Uh, it's hard to tell what is truth and what is fiction relating to the Aztecs uh, because they are a society that uh, a lot of their history was written by their enemies. Uh, we know they, they did do blood sacrifice, that they did uh, sacrifice um, people who uh, they captured in warfare. Uh, and they sacrifice them to their gods. However, we don't know really how super true it was. Uh, there was actually a really, uh, I can't remember, I, it was called Apocalypto. Um, Mel Gibson made a movie called Apocalypto that depicted um, these practices among uh, the Aztecs. However, Mel Gibson uh, is known uh, now to be uh, pretty flagrantly racist. And um, he, his source material for Apocalypto was those histories written by the enemies of the Aztecs. So yeah, the Aztecs did do that stuff, but we don't really know how much of that stuff uh, they actually did. Okay, moving on. Now, has anyone here uh, shown, has anyone here actually read Ishmael? Is that a book that, has anyone read it? No, okay. It, it was written, I think, it was probably about 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now. Um, it was old when I read it. Um, Ishmael is a book, uh, it's a really, if you haven't read Ishmael, if you're interested in uh, environmentalism, if you're interested in uh, how we as a society deal with technological advancement and how we interact with our world. I really suggest reading it. Um, so the I Ishmael proposition was posited by author and philosopher Daniel Quinn, who it, his main book was called Ishmael, but he wrote three books about it. Uh, Ish Ishmael, the story of B and my Ishmael are the three books. Anyway, he posits that since the course of since the agricultural revolution, humanity has become separated from other forms of life on this planet, is basically his big idea that he posits. And if we maintain the separation from other life forms, we're, we're screwed, we're doomed, right? But if we can learn how to actually live with other life forms, we might be able to save ourselves and then from there he gets much more philosophical in the later books. Uh, but, and the, the, the big, uh, and Ishmael is the name of the telepathic gorilla that he's actually having this conversation with. It's posited as a conversation humanity is having with nature, right? And at one point in the book, uh, the gorilla says, I have amazing news for you. 
man is not alone on this planet. He is part of a community upon which he depends, right? Meaning that community being all other life forms that are not human. Uh, and he does, uh, in Ishmael, he just does a, an amazing job of showing how we as humans have this ideology that we're the only ones on the planet, but the reality is that we aren't, right? Um, it, it's really a neat idea, but the reason I bring it up at this point is because they make the argument that it was at the point of the agricultural revolution that humanity separated from the rest of uh, the globe, right? And they make the point that you guys, you humans, lived for hundreds of thousands of years being in sync with the planet, right? And it's only been, it's only been about 5,000 years that you humans have been out of sync, right? And it's only about 100 years that we've really been screwing up super, super, super bad, right? So we can go back. Uh, and it's a really, it's a, it's a super big and super important idea. So how is stuff made in agricultural societies? Uh, well, obviously there's a lot of farming, but what else, right? Uh, production in agricultural societies is set in the household. And this is a big difference between agricultural societies and our society we're living in right now. So a household is defined as a group of people united by kinship or other links who share residence and organize production, consumption, and distribution amongst themselves, right? So note that and there. Uh, in this sense, you really have to be producing something to uh, be, have a household as such uh, and, and, and in that way. So if you and a roommate are living in an apartment, but you really don't share any food expenses, you don't really interact with each other, that's not really a household in the sense. Additionally, households may include employees. Uh, really, what we're talking about with this concept is an economic unit, right, that makes stuff. Because in agricultural societies, and this is sometimes called the cottage industry, in agricultural societies, households were not only where you live, households make stuff, right? Uh, so uh, farms in agricultural societies were your home, but they were also your workplace. So uh, a farm produced food, but it also could produce yarn, it could produce cloth, it could produce rope, candles, furniture, my great grandfather's farm had a small coal mine, so he produced coal that he sold for extra money, right? It wasn't everything they needed to live. It was like a supplement thing, and he had to like shimmy up into this, what was a hole in the ground is really what it was, and then pick the coal out and then shimmy back and sell that. Uh, lumber was uh, something else, like cutting down trees and that sort of thing. Um, so here we have a depiction, I believe this is uh, in India, of people uh, making pots. And I, I was careful to select these images. And uh, according to uh, my source, these are people that this is, this pot making area is part of their home, right? Uh, additionally, uh, this is a, a uh, man from the, U I think it's U he's Ukrainian. Uh, he is making baskets in his, uh, in his home, right? And then selling those baskets uh, or trading those baskets. Um, I find this stuff, let's look at my next slide for a second. Yeah, I find this, this, these things super interesting. I, I'm gonna make up, I'm gonna come back to this point.
uh, but because uh, it, it gives us some ideas as to where we cannot take our economy from here, right? Uh, what will our future economy look like? Um, the agricultural era lasted a very, very, very long time, right? Uh, it was it was the main mode of production in our society for, as we saw, thousands of years. Uh, empires came and went. There were many, many societies that existed only within the agricultural mode, um, and they didn't advance, and so they don't have to, right? Uh, uh, exact government types varied from society to society. Some were super hierarchical, some were less hierarchical, uh, some had kings, some were more what we would call democratic in modern sense. Uh, but feudalism uh, is a agricultural society of note. Um, and feudalism uh, was present in uh, Europe. It was also present in uh, China. Uh, it existed in certain ways in South America as well. Anyway, feudalism is a highly hierarchical system of government in which peasants are permitted to farm land in exchange for military production from those uh, higher in the hierarchy. Now, I'll talk about in a second here the difference between peasants and serfs. This better term here in this definition where it says peasants here, it really should say serf. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So common people were those who worked the land and they paid taxes. That's what most people did in the world, is they worked the land, they did some kind of farming, and they paid taxes. Uh, products of the land were said to be the property of the king, right? They didn't really have personal property as such. Everything in the kingdom was thought to belong to the king. Um, even the people were, were thought to kind of belong to the king, not really, but kind of. Uh, serfs were permitted to use the products with his permission. Uh, knights were professional warriors. So if you were a knight uh, or others, some soldiers, they were full-time warriors. That was a way to move yourself up in society during that era. Uh, however, uh, your peasants, your serfs, could be conscripted into militar militaries if the lords saw fit, right? So, uh, and here we have a, a breakdown of the hierarchy. So at the bottom, the people living on the land uh, in a given area, these are uh, serfs. Uh, the difference between the peasant and the serf is that a serf was the farm worker. A serf, all serfs are peasants, not all peasants are serfs, right? Uh, a peasant was somebody who did not own their own land and was tied to the land. Do I have that on the next slide? No. Uh, they were tied to the land. I think it's in a couple slides. They could not leave. They had to stay right there. If you weren't like that, you were a peasant. Then though, the serfs, they paid their taxes to the knights and the vassals, right? Uh, so, uh, and these, this was like Sir, Sir Bob or Sir Henry or whatever, right? The serfs, those people controlled land and a certain number of serfs. And then those knights, had to listen to lords who were higher up in the pecking order, and every lord had a certain number of knights, and all those knights had their peasants, and then all of the lords were um, overseen by the king. And then in some places, uh, especially later on in the medieval era in Europe, uh, the king was overseen by emperors, which are like super kings in some places. And then there also were emperor structures uh, in ancient China too. If you really want to compare feudal systems, uh, the Chinese feudal system and the ancient Europe, the European feudal system are the most comparable to each other. Anyway, 
As I mentioned, uh, slave labor was also present in agricultural societies. And this is the big difference between ancient slavery and slavery as it existed in the United States. So slave labor was present, but people were not born slaves. That wasn't a thing in those versions of society. And this is a depiction of Roman slavery. People, but people could become slaves by being conquered by an invading enemy, right? So part of warfare was going in and abducting people and making them slaves to go do things. Um, that was how you got to be a slave. Or in ancient Rome, you could, uh, you could sell yourself into slavery for a certain number of years and you would have a contract and you would have your contract written out and say you were going to be a slave for X amount of time. And then after that amount of time, you were let go to be free again, right? And slavery was not based on race and slavery was not permanent. Uh, a good example of this, and this is actually uh, in the Torah and the Old Testament, is that every seven years, the ancient Hebrews, uh, they had the celebration called a Jubilee. And the Jubilee, and then I think every uh, 49 years, there was an extra big Jubilee. Um, or Anyway, uh, that's not the point. But every seven years, not only did they take the year off and they let the the farm rest but they also freed all the slaves right so the longest amount of time you could be a slave of the ancient hebrews was for seven years uh which goes contrary to really how we think of slavery because in the modern sense in american society when we think of slavery we we think american slavery now here's my bit about the serfs Serfs have often been compared to slaves, but they were, it, it wasn't the same thing. Sometimes, again, it's, as Americans, we get confused as to what a slave was and what a slave wasn't. Uh, serfs were said to be tied to the land, right? So serfs were better off than slaves, effectively, because a serf couldn't leave the land. The serf had to be a farmer, right? but they couldn't be bought and sold the way slaves were. Serfs were not considered property. They were just people who were stuck on the land who had to be farmers. That's who serfs were. Um, a king in most circumstances couldn't just kill a serf. It did happen, but there then would be uh, ramifications even with the king too. He'd probably just get a priest yelling at him, but it's better than nothing, right? Um, so, so sometimes when people talk about serfs and slaves and have these weird conversations about slavery, especially American slavery, they start to talk about serfs and indentured servants, especially in the early United States. They aren't the same thing. They aren't the same thing at all. Let's talk about these modern economies then. So industrialism. This is when we start to th move into what we call the modern era. And as I mentioned, uh, if you're a history major, for example, these dates are super approximate. It's just to give you a concept of where it is. So the Industrial Revolution was a series of technological advancements that made possible dramatically higher rates of production and the development of modern society. So there were a bunch of pieces that came together to create the Industrial Revolution. And on this slide, I have the first piece, and then we'll move on to additional pieces. So the first piece was the internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine allowed for and continues to allow for population centers to develop away from bodies of water and not be reliant on animal power, right? This allowed human societies to basically spread over the whole planet because prior to the Industrial Revolution, we were pretty much stuck on major waterways and not just any 
better way. So here is a map of Ohum at different rates around the world at different times. Cleveland is, and Cincinnati are the oldest cities in Ohio, right? You will note that Cincinnati is also along a major river and Cleveland is along Lake Erie. Columbus didn't really take off for a while, even though we do have a river, it's not that great of a river. If you look at the archeological record of the Native Americans that lived in Ohio uh, before uh, white people got here, they didn't live where Columbus is right now. It was, the, and I've talked to people at the Ohio History Connection about this. This, and I'm talking about, because I'm, I'm in Columbus right now. This area wasn't really useful for them. They, they just didn't really have anything here. Um, it was kind of a game preserve, but like there isn't a reason for a city to be here if you don't have internal combustion engines, right? There's no source of power. There's nothing really unique about this area. And the only reason why Columbus is here is because it's in the middle of Ohio. And that makes sense in modern terms because it makes sense to have your capital in the middle of the state. Um, but yeah, internal combustion engines basically work by creating a little tiny explosion in the engine, and then that tiny explosion causes your crankshaft to move, and in doing that, you can, then can make machines go, and ta-da, society. Another technology that the Industrial Revolution gave us was interchangeable parts. You guys still there? Is is the lecture working working out? Am I? Eh. Okay, we're gonna keep going as long as we have it. It's a little bit choppy. Um, at a bare minimum, you will have the recording later. I think it's working. Okay. Uh, so interchangeable parts was uh, something we got. This is honestly kind of hard for us to wrap our heads around what it was like before interchangeable parts. So you can go to the hardware store to get it today and get any of these pieces that don't necessarily go to anything, but you can get any of these machined little pieces to build your own machines or devices, whether it's a fence, or whether it's something much more bigger and much more complex, you can get these little, these fasteners and any number of other machined parts, right, to build stuff out of. This enables two things. It makes it much easier to build machines, right? And if a machine breaks, it makes it much easier to fix it because prior to the era of interchangeable parts, and interchangeable parts really came into being in about the early 1800s. So in terms of the Industrial Revolution, it was relatively late along. But once interchangeable parts became possible, you could fix machines, right? Prior to that moment, um, it wasn't really possible to actually fix machines. You had to just go get a whole damn new machine and that would cost a colossal amount of money. It's a big deal. Uh, the assembly line is another major uh, point in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, now, the assembly line is more of a social innovation, really, than a technological innovation. Uh, Henry Ford, this is from one of Henry Ford's assembly lines. He, he had this grand idea to, in scale, make these just people lined up, each person doing a little task over and over and over again. Each person does the task, they get really good at their little task. And if we line everyone to up, down in a line, you can get really complex jobs done in a pretty quick way, right? Uh, and here we have an overhead image of a steel mill. Uh, steel mills, uh, they continue to be this way. Uh, but the classic steel mills uh, in Pittsburgh 
were effectively assembly lines that could be up to two miles long, right? So this assembly line would produce one thing, this one would produce another thing, this one would produce another thing, this one would produce another thing. Uh, very interesting as far as that goes. And auto plants were much the same way. Um, yeah. And then this is tied in with a concept known as ta Taylorism that we'll discuss in a few slides. Now, industrial slavery. This is the one that continues to, well, it shaped really uh, the United States as it is. Uh, so sl American slavery was only possible due to its concurrence with the Industrial Revolution, right? Slavery in America was the worst version of slavery to ever exist in human history. And the reason for that is a couple fold. First of all, there was this uh, what was called the triangle or the triangular trade in which the United States grew tobacco and cotton and sent that to Europe. Europe then sent textile and rum to uh, Africa and in particular, uh, it goes off the screen, uh, in particular Southern Africa and Eastern Africa to, uh, and those people there uh, kidnapped people and abducted them and raided villages uh, with, and they traded, uh, there were some uh, people indigenous to Africa that were selling people into slavery, but most of the people in Africa uh, were of European descent uh, capturing people. Then this rum was traded to the slavers, and then uh, different people would take slaves to North America, and then the process would keep going. Now, this is a really complex, and I hate to use any positive words regarding slavery, but it was complex and it was advanced and it was industrial, right? You needed big, big complex boats to make that happen. And that wasn't possible prior to the industrial era. Uh, similarly, uh, this picture here, I'm pretty sure you can see it better than I can uh, if you're looking on your main computer screen. Uh, this is a device, and there were many of these kinds of devices uh, used to punish uh, quote-unquote disobedient slaves. This is heavy iron that probably weighed somewhere between 30 pounds and 50 pounds put around this man's neck. It was kept there potentially for weeks or however long uh, the uh, slave owner would want to punish uh, the person for. Um, you can imagine how impossible it would be to sleep with this on you. You could imagine the kind of damage that would do to your neck and do to your body. Uh, also, there was probably an element of humiliation involved there. Uh, surely, uh, they would be expected to keep working with this as well. And this kind of wrought metal, right? Crafted metal, look how straight that is, right? That had to have been manufactured, right? With interchangeable parts, with the, the accoutrement of industrialization, right? These are the reasons why slavery was horrible in the United it, it's they came together in really a worst case scenario that allowed for slavers to dominate people and dominate people in scale right dominate you could have a plantation with hundreds of hundreds of workers right on it and that wasn't possible prior to the modern era um, there are arguments made that uh, one of the major reasons why uh, the Civil War broke out is that it was a conflict between a more, a more advanced uh, industrial society and, in the North and a slightly less advanced, more agrarian 
uh, oriented society that we're using industrial technologies. And the reality of the matter is that the Northerners maybe didn't care too much about slavery, but they became separated enough uh, to, uh, to, to care. Um, any questions or comments though? I bring it up and I explain it in this detail because I think, first of all, history is super important. Second of all, it is important to understand the pieces of the horror, right? And understand how things came together uh, and how the structure of society made for terrible situations. I think that's super important uh, for understanding societies. Uh, many of the innovations of the industrial era were uh, driven by what was called Taylorism. Uh, Taylorism was a philosophy and strategy of maximizing productivity by controlling all aspects of uh, production. Taylorism, so let me look at my next slide, see what I got. So Taylorism, the idea was that this expert would come into the factor and uh, he would uh, time every motion being done by the worker. Here we, this is actually, I think this is a cartoon uh, actually advocating for, uh, for women in the work, in the home that it's really hard to be a domestic worker. Uh, of course, it has obvious sexist ramifications, but that was the society. Anyway, what we see here, the, the joke, if you were, is that uh, the Taylorist uh, expert would measure the milliseconds that it took to put the, the shovel down. Then they would measure the milliseconds it took to lift the shovel up. And then the milliseconds it took to throw the shovel of coal or whatever. Um, in that way, uh, they would time exactly how long it took every single job, right? And they were effectively playing a game of scale to try to make the factory more productive. Um, Taylorism is often criticized for being highly dehumanizing because if you can imagine, and I think many of us have had bosses uh, who micromanage, right? You know that term micromanaging where they, if you work at a pizza place, they like to count exactly how many pepperonis put on the pizza and exactly how you lay out the sauce and exactly how you have your hat on and all that. That's a Tayloristic concept because, uh, and that, that hurts us as people, right? That's not good for workers. It, it damages our sense of well-being and all that. It, it's not psychologically good. Um, but Taylorism was kind of celebrated and they called them time studies, right? Uh, it was celebrated in um, this era as uh, being a way that we could be super productive, especially a way that businesses could make money. Uh, we have a concept here of the economizing, economizing behavior. Uh, this is choosing a course of action to maximize perceived benefit. Now, human beings have always done this, right? And you do this too without even thinking about it. Even if we di didn't live in a society that does economize behavior, if you're trying to get something done, you can just think, I want to work harder to get this done faster, right? That's choosing economizing behavior. Uh, however, in our world, uh, we determine how we do almost all things due to economic logic instead of biological drives. That is taking economizing behavior to a really kind of extreme mode and uh, sociologist Max Weber uh, calls this the iron cage of rationality. So what Weber says, and it's Weber, not Weber, by the way. What Weber says is that the reason why some of us wake up at super early in the morning, earlier than we would ever want to wake up, is because we have been conditioned to operate in 
either factories or something like a factory where time is actually absolutely critical to, to maximize productivity, right? Now, in previous eras, people relied on roosters to wake them up in the morning, right? That is more, uh, or, or just your body. God forbid, can you imagine waking up when you want to wake up because your body feels rested, right? That is more of a biological drive. Weber observed that we are going in and we're being economic are actually um, and they're damaging to us, but for the end of productivity. Anyway, so are, are, are you guys still there? We're kind of. Am I understandable? That's all I want to know. Am I understandable? Most of the time. Most of the time. That's all I need. Thank you. Most, most of the time's good enough. Uh, if there's anything that is ununderstandable, um, I'm pretty sure that the recording is pretty smooth. So you can just go back there tomorrow and see what you picked up. I'm sorry about this. That This connection is not great. Um, so industrialism. Uh, the workplace is another concept you know what, I'm feeling uh, we should take a break. Uh, just take like a five minute break or so, maybe let the internet tubes rest. Let's come back here at 7.37 and uh, go for the rest of the class, okay? So I'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, so I'm gonna get started again. I have a, um, hmm. I have an idea. So uh, those of you that know where it is or find it, uh, help me by giving me the little thumbs up guy. The, the little thumbs up response icon. Can you do that? Okay, great. Okay, everyone find your thumbs up icon. Okay, now we're gonna use those. Uh, I just read, I do want to be able to see your faces, but to try to deal with this, uh, we are going to turn our cameras off the way everyone wants it to be. We're turning our cameras off, but know where that thumbs up logo is. Apparently, turning off the cameras will be able to um, save bandwidth and I will be a little bit smoother. Because um, I just noticed as people were signing out um, that there was, it was a little bit smoother with those people that stayed. So that's what we're going to do. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to get the start up again. Um, and then it is, let's see, 740 right now. Um, this will pro where I am in the lecture, it might take, oh, maybe another 20 minutes to half hour. And then we will go into our documentary. Hopefully that documentary will work to stream through Zoom. If it doesn't work to stream through Zoom, even with cameras off, uh, I have provided a link too, but I do want uh, to be able to stream it just so I can have a little bit of interactivity and comment on it. Cause I haven't seen the whole, I, I've seen most of it. I haven't seen the whole documentary to this point. Um, and I wanna be able to comment on that. If I, for example, make you watch something grossly inappropriate. Um, so, the workplace. The workplace is an interesting thing um, in that, one second. Uh, the workplace is an interesting thing in that we, um, it hasn't always existed. It is a modern uh, social, uh, construct. It is not something that existed in agricultural societies. It didn't really exist in any society prior, prior to the modern era. Uh, the vast majority of activity took place in the home or very near the home. So if you were a farmer, then uh, it took place, uh, your work took place in your home, right? Uh, and that uh, creates certain social problems that make our modern life really difficult and suck in ways that our ancestors didn't really have to deal with. For example, having to interact with people you don't know and you may have very shallow relationships with. If you've ever worked in an office or any kind of workplace, you know that there are people in that workplace that you would never talk to if you didn't have to talk to them at work. And that's awkward and that's weird. And you are right, it is awkward and weird. It's not something we've always had. Bosses uh, that micromanage the way that people work as opposed to focusing on output. Uh, prior to the modern era, we didn't have 
uh, people telling us how to do our economic production as long as we actually made the stuff, right? Uh, that kind of overly harping micromanagement is also a side effect of the modern era. And additionally, very classic uh, dilemma uh, is uh, rush hour as well. Uh, in rush hours, uh, we have a big rush to go into a city in the morning, big rush to come out of the city at night. If you leave like three minutes later, then it can just be a colossal um, a, a, a mess, right? You can be late for work, you can screw everything up. Just a little, little touch of uh, delay there. Um, now, I find this super interesting because, and we're especially seeing it this year in 2020, right? With everyone working from home. We are seeing what I, I, I was thinking about this in like 2012, 2013. Are we going to start seeing this move back to cottage industries? This move away from the workplace? Because workplaces do suck, right? And one of the major ramifications that I see happening relating to COVID is that we are going to see a move back to either working in the home or maybe cottage industry kind of stuff. I do think that that is the next phase our economy is going to be taking. Now, will that mean a new type of economy? I don't know. Uh, anyway, but it, it, I just find that super duper interesting. So, and we're still in the past, remember. We're still in industrialism here. Uh, remember that industrial era I had was, 19, was 1750 to about 1975. I'm still talking about industrialism. Uh, in industrialism, it was common for people to work for a firm, and it still is. Uh, a firm is defined as an institution composed of kin and or non-kin that is organized primarily for financial gain, right? Uh, firm. Uh, a firm. Examples of firms are a bank, acre, grocery store, right? Things we often call businesses, right? A business is a not perfect synonym for a firm. Um, Examples of not firms are a church, a public school, uh, somebody's home, their, their private home. That is something that is uh, not a uh, firm. Um, I'm just seeing and looking at all uh, these, uh, all your names and that's fine that it's like this now. If we do decide to keep with uh, the no video or limited video, it would be super great if you could get profile pictures up on uh, Zoom, just so I can see human faces. Anyway, that, that's for in the future. Don't bother fiddling with that right now. Um, so not firms are churches, right? A church it hypothetically exists for uh, reasons other than the financial. Uh, public schools, right? Public schools aren't trying to make a profit, right? Uh, your house that you live in uh, is not trying to make, oh my God, I have a cricket that just woke up. This is gonna be amazing. So anyway, fun times. So those are not firms. Oh, you're gonna love this cricket action. So working conditions during the industrial era were very dangerous and very unregulated, especially during the 1800s. Uh, during this era, uh, very long work days and uh, days off. So work days were very long and days off were not heard of, right? You didn't get days off. You, if you worked at a job, you worked seven days a week, you worked 24 seven, you might get Christmas off, right? That's, that's what it was. Um, there is a very good depiction of this in Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, of what working conditions were like uh, in the uh, early industrial era. 
maiming and maiming injuries were common. It was common to be wounded to the point that you would be irrevocable. Your body would be irrevocably damaged. That was something that people dealt with. Uh, child labor was common. Here are pictures of children working at looms uh, in a textile factory. Uh, children. The, it, sometimes a joke is made of this. This is absolutely real. Little kids were employed in these places because their little hands could reach into the machines to get things out, right? That's very true. And it would be very easy as a little kid uh, to uh, get just hideously damaged, to like get part of your, like lose a finger or even lose a hand in these machines. Uh, discrimination of all types was common, right? And the reason for all of this is because there was nothing regulating industry during this era. Here we have pictures of a newspaper uh, from the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, fire, which is one of the uh, colossal tragedies that occurred uh, in the uh, second part of the 1800s, I think maybe somewhere near 1875, if I remember right. Uh, the, tri the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory uh, was uh, what we today would call a sweatshop, uh, where we they had rows and rows of women uh, lined up because at that time it was thought sewing was one of the few jobs women could do because it was an intensely sexist society. Um, women were lined up in these rows and rows, very poorly ventilated with all of this sewing material to make uh, shirts out of, right? The, a shirt waist was a, a triangle shirt. Yeah, it, uh, it was a very common type of shirt. Anyway, though, what made this uh, catastrophe happen, happen was there were no fire escapes and there were some uh, spots in the, in the building where the emergency exits were actually fake emergency exits. Uh, some of them were painted on, some of them were nailed shut uh, to keep people from uh, being able to leave early, right? The, the emphasis was uh, that of being able to work and being able uh, to um, produce uh, more money, right? It was all driven by pure uh, greed, effectively. Now, as a result of these conditions, uh, many workers formed unions. Uh, a definition of a union is a group of workers that agree to engage in collective action toward the end of bettering conditions for all workers. Now, unions can take a variety of forms globally. In the United States, unions tend to be centered around uh, workplace contracts. And uh, whenever you talk to a union people, they'll always talk about their contract and what their contract is doing. Uh, that is, uh, and those contracts are, are collective, right? So if we had a union contract of adjuncts at Otterbein, all of us would have the same collective contract. And the, re the benefit of that is that it keeps workers as a unified force to act for what we need collectively. Um, unions used to be a whole lot more common. That is one of the things that distinguishes previous generations of workers in the United States from us today is we still do have unions. I'm actually, I'm a member of a union at one of my uh, schools I teach for in New Mexico, but there are far fewer unions today because of union busting activities done in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s that really messed a lot of that up. I'll talk about how it helped everything in a second. Um, union, union rights were not legally recognized in the United States until 1947. They weren't recognized by the federal government, but that didn't keep workers from organizing as well. Um, there were a lot of places where forming a union was discouraged and illegal, but the people continued to fight for increased benefits, increased wages to make uh, for justice effectively in the workplace. Uh, this is a very common uh, statement, a union statement. Unions are the folks that brought you the weekend, child labor laws, overtime, minimum wage, 
injury protection, workman's compensation insurance, pension security, the right to organize, all these things. The weekend is absolutely true. The eight day work day is absolutely true. And we see today in our modern economies, so many people um, losing that stuff, right? A lot of us work over the weekends. There are times when I work over the weekend. Unions fought for our abilities to have weekends. Um, the eight hour day, uh, a lot of us work a lot more than eight hour days. In COVID, a lot of us are working more than eight hour days. That wouldn't really happen if unions were much stronger uh, in the United States. Um, I'm really happy uh, I have my union out in New Mexico because they really help to, um, I just rubbed a little bit of, uh, hot pepper in my eyes. So I'm gonna have a little trouble with that for a couple minutes. Anyway, uh, I'm fine. I do this actually relatively common. Um, the reason why we have unions is to uh, protect those workplace conditions. Um, and I actually, uh, I think I've mentioned this before. I was a union organizer for about three years. I turned out to be pretty bad at it, uh, but I, I really do strongly believe in the union cause um, because workers uh, deserve certain things. So. Uh, by the, now, it was a really good time to be a worker, a wage earner in the second half of the 20th century. Um, American jobs had become quite stable uh, by the mid-1950s. And the reason why those jobs had become so stable is for two factors. First of all, union contracts had become very good by that point in the 20th century. Uh, those jobs that were really terrible in the beginning of the 20th century, things like meat pack packing, things like truck driving, things like working in steel mills, things like being a coal miner, those jobs are pretty unforgiving. But if workers are given the wage that actually um, gives them the share of the profits that they deserve, that they put into the labor, they can live pretty good lives. So that's one part of what made that, those jobs good. Another part of what made, those, made that era in the economy good is the fact that the United States escaped World War II almost entirely unscathed from a production standpoint. So our competitors uh, globally were, um, Germany. Prior to World War II, Germany, France, England, uh, Italy, uh, Japan, China, all of these places were major competitors of the United States. But World War II effectively wiped them out in, ter in terms of their capacity to produce things and their factories. Additionally, um, it built up American industry to to make us able to provide goods and sell goods uh, for the rest of the world. Um, so that's a major, major super advantage that that's why the United States was so powerful for so long. Uh, and what kind of created that baby boomer bubble that uh, made so, things so good for so long. Um, and what adds to a degree of uncertainty for our future because that thing uh, isn't going to happen again. So with industrialism uh, comes, uh, came capitalism. So capitalist perspectives drove much of economic development in the industrial era. Uh, and if you're not super familiar with what exactly capitalism is, uh, capitalists believe that capital should be used with the primary goal of increasing their owner's uh, financial wealth. So a definition of capital could be called economic resources, right? So you're talking about money, you are talking about uh, factories you may own, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, socialist theories tend to call, socialist theorists tend to call that the means of production. Market exchange uh, is an economic system in which goods and services uh, are, bought and sold at a money price determined primarily by the forces of supply and demand. So 
this gives you, this slide, uh, if it's not super clear, gives you two things that capitalists believe. Capitalists believe that the point of business is to make money. And that is, that, that sounds familiar. That's effectively what our American economy is built on. And capitalists also believe in supply and demand, right? That the amount of money you charge for a thing is absolutely, um, it should be determined by how much people are willing to pay for it. Now, these beliefs and this belief system, contrary to what uh, American um, political propaganda would have us believe in the, the middle of the 20th century at the height of the Cold War, not everyone believed that these things um, should absolutely always be true, that all businesses should be always driven by profit, for example. Uh, so the, those types of questions caused this thing called socialism to come into being. Socialists believe, let me take a drink of water. Socialists believe that workers should be the ones in control of capital. Uh, so socialists often call that stuff the means of production, or sometimes they call it productive property. Pro productive property are those things that are owned and that can make more things. So examples of productive property include factories, include farmland, include fast food restaurants, sewing machines, all that stuff. All, that's, all that stuff that you own that you can use to make other stuff. So work, socialists also believe that when workers, when the business profits, those profits should be distributed equally among workers, right? It shouldn't be only the boss that gets the profit. Workers, if the, if the business does well, workers should get a raise. That's the simplest way to say it. Um, so a worker uh, from this definition are people who create value of goods and services. And then in this relationship, owners pay workers to run the means of production so that those goods may be sold for a profit for the benefit of the owner. Now, the, those two definitions are expressly, um, the worker and owner definitions there uh, need to be used uh, when talking about socialism specifically. These aren't really independent definitions. These are uh, the way uh, socialist philosophy and political uh, ideas work. Uh, there are some socialist theorists that claim that owners are actually entirely unneeded. Uh, some have claimed that they are parasitic, uh, that sort of thing, that they actually add nothing to the actual relationship, that it's something that workers could do entirely. Now, these are, these are big abstract ideas. Um, now, often socialist theorists, socialist thinkers, uh, talk about uh, workers should control the means of production. That's like a big central component to what actually uh, is socialism, is this concept of workers controlling the means of production. Um, and what does that actually mean? It's really up for debate. Uh, here I have just four examples of, let me see if I can adjust my, one second. I'm trying to make my screen a little clear. Oh, it's not going to work. Anyway, uh, what does that mean? Here's four examples. Uh, you could have a co-op model uh, in which all workers vote on all actions taken by the business, the firm, the organization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when the organization makes money, then the workers also make money. Uh, this model is uh, not super common in the United States, but it is, it is common, it does exist. Any city of any major size, there will be at least a handful of businesses that are run in this type of co-op model. Um, in, if you know uh, Clintonville and Columbus at all, uh, Patty Cake Bakery is actually a co-op model uh, like this. They vote on uh, their cupcakes, they vote on what cupcakes they're going to make, uh, what do they do with new cupcakes, where the, do they priority, 
prioritize what hours are they going to keep open all of that stuff is voted on by all of the workers there because they only have about uh i think 10 workers max so they can all just sit down and have a meeting right another model you would use for workers controlling the means of production would be a representative model where workers vote for uh, department representatives those representatives are part of a board who will determine how the organization is run. This representative type model is pretty uncommon in the United States. It is uncommon and almost a really alien idea that you would say run a steel mill or run a manufacturing facility by committee like this. But there are places that do it uh, like this. There's a documentary uh, called The Take where uh, workers uh, built up this, uh, they, they, they started to run their factory like this. It's a pretty good example. Uh, the union model is uh, sort of workers controlling the means of production, kind of. So in the union model, uh, bosses retain ownership of the business. They still own the business, but how the workers are treated and how much they make are determined by union contract negotiations. So it takes some of that power away from the boss and it redistributes it and puts it legally into the contract that is negotiated by workers. Uh, this model is common in the United States, uh, but it used to be a whole lot more common. Um, this model is legally easier in the United States uh, but, but the boss retains uh, most of the control of how the business is actually run. A union, for example, uh, can't tell the boss that uh, we're, let's say if we uh, make Pontiac Sunfires uh, type of car, that we're suddenly going to be a Ford plant that makes Ford Windstars, right, which is a minivan. Uh, that, that it, the, the union can't tell the boss what they're going to make uh, the union basically can only tell the boss how they can treat the workers. And then we have uh, the infamous Soviet model, which is the chief example that people use uh, of so socialism not working, and it, it didn't work really in the Soviet Union, uh, in which all businesses are owned by the government, and the government is the representative of the people. So therefore, if the government is the perfect represent representation of the people, then uh, therefore people control the means of production. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of political rhetoric built up in that. Uh, the, hypothetically, theoretically, when the businesses make profit, that profit is then distributed to the people uh, via public services, and then workers are given high wages and benefits, again, I say, hypothetically. That was the rhetoric used by the Soviet Union during the Soviet era uh, in order to basically justify their reason for existing. Um, didn't quite work super great. So post-industrialism, this is the modern era. This is the economic system that we are in. Post-industrialism has existed from, uh, again, approximately 1975 to our present day, uh, right? So only about 45 years uh, we've had uh, this economic style, but we only had industrialism since 1750, right? And then we only had agriculturalism uh, since 8,000. We're seeing that, that speed up, closing and closing and closing, uh, that is definitely a trend in human societies is that we technologically advance faster and faster and faster. Uh, if you're interested in that concept and related concepts, uh, do, you can do some research on this idea in, I, in uh, computers and technology called the concept of the AI singularity, uh, where things might get real weird real fast in the next 20 years or so. A relating uh, technological development. Anyway, though, in our world, um, most people's jobs include processing and enabling information uh, pro and providing services or a combination of the two. Uh, so information type jobs are things like app development or data entry, right? Obviously, there's a lot more money to be made in app development. You, you 
it's a more of a prestigious job. Uh, data entry is a pretty low level uh, IT job, still super important, but there are um, different levels of prestige associate. All, not all IT is glamorous. Uh, same goes with service jobs. So you have a growth worker, we have nurses, and then we also have lawyers, right? You can make a really wide range of money uh, doing service jobs. And then we have jobs that are combinations, right? So online teaching. Uh, I teaching, classical teaching is uh, classified as a service-based job, right? But uh, in my online work that I do, there are certain technical aspects uh, that need to be done. And I do need to have a certain degree of technical knowledge. Uh, IT help desks are really, it's a computer job, right? But it's also dealing with people kind of job. You need to be able to talk to people over the phone and explain things. It's really a combination job there. So, uh, jobs in our post-industrial economy, uh, our jobs are less stable than in previous eras. Um, in our economy as it exists, be working at a place from three to five years is sometimes considered a long time to be at a place. Um, there are previous, in previous generations in the industrial economy, uh, it was not unheard of uh, for people to work at a, one steel, a specific steel mill or in a specific coal mine for their whole life, right? Like that, that and that's almost un, unfathomable now that you would work someplace your whole life. Uh, but that's how it was. Uh, additionally, uh, the concept of temporary worker is very, very uh, key to many elements of the post-industrial economy. Uh, there are gig economy type jobs, such as people like Lyft and Uber drivers, uh, other app delivery drivers uh, delivering everything from uh, in places where it's legal, de delivering cannabis, delivering groceries, delivering fast food, all sorts of things like that. Uh, there are freelance writers, there are content generators. Uh, if you've ever worked freelance writing, uh, you sometimes get paid by the word, you sometimes get paid by the product or the blog post or whatever. Um, that's, that's one type of temporary worker where you're only paid per job, right? And that's, that's tough work to maintain. And then we have pseudo temporary workers uh, this is just the term I use for this. Uh, these are people who work at jobs for years and years and years, but are rehired to quote unquote new jobs every year or six months. That's how adjunct faculty work. That's how I work. That's how I teach. I have been working, uh, I've been uh, doing uh, Autobahn stuff for about a year now, right? I've been teaching at um, University of New Mexico for about six years now but I get this new employee paperwork every six months at University of New Mexico uh, because I'm effectively rehired every six months. And that's, that's really a problem in a, for a lot of people in our society because temporary worker classifications are used by employers to avoid providing things like healthcare, to avoid providing things like pensions and other benefits that are really super important. Um, so these, these classifications of temporary workers and uh, gig economies, um, it's, it's a problem. Uh, it's a big problem. And if we were able to uh, develop uh, better unions, we would be able to try to fix some of these problems. But slave labor continues to also be a problem in our post-industrial society as well. We don't have slavery like we did in the United States, thank God. But it's st there are people still being forced to work uh, in our society and globally. Um, in developed countries, uh, human trafficking is uh, how where most of the uh, modern slaves, if you will, come from. Uh, this is the practice of abducting or trapping both children or adults. 
This often takes advantage of illegal immigrants or other at-risk individuals. Uh, women and other minorities are more often prone to human trafficking um, due to uh, basically inherently sexist and racist structures in our society. And uh, trafficked people are typically forced into either sex work or domestic labor. That's what uh, slavery looks like in developed countries. Now in Industri in less developed countries, uh, sweatshops uh, force people to work very long hours in dangerous conditions, and they hold people against their will. People are forced to live on the compound or in very shabby dormitories that are right beside the factory, right? We're not talking about factory work, we're talking about forced factory work. Uh, this is most common in clothing manufacturing, um, sweatshops, are less common in developed countries, but there are sweatshops in developed countries in the United States. Uh, the most common places you would find sweatshops in the United States are in uh, New York City and in Los Angeles. Uh, that largely has to do with the fact that they're major commercial hubs and it's easiest to unload a product in a place like that. Um, it's a major problem. It's a major global problem. Uh, it is not the same type of uh, forced labor as uh, it was in the American South, which absolutely was the worst case scenario. Uh, but there are places today where people are being forced to work uh, for either very low wages or no wages at all, which is a bummer. Okay, here's our culture of the week, uh, the Nuxalk Nation. I know I'm not saying that right, probably. Uh, it is not a language I'm super familiar with, um, but our documentary we're gonna try to watch together uh, is uh, gonna help us out with that. Let's look at a few maps though. So uh, the Nuxalk slash Bella Coola uh, Nation is located right here in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, they are then uh, referred to as First Nations people because they are not in the United States. Uh, so uh, we have a uh, larger version over here. This, so this green region corresponds with this red region. Too. It is just more of a close up. Uh, it's uh, north here. Um, yeah. Oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. Ah, okay. Uh, a note on terminology, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in Canada, the people we call American Indians or Native Americans uh, are called First Nations people. Uh, in Canada, that's just like the term their government has determined. Uh, indigenous peoples is also an appropriate term. Uh, however, the term indigenous peoples can also be applied to tribal people in Australia in South America or in Africa as well. Uh, those are all called indigenous peoples. Uh, additionally, uh, the Laplanders in Northern Europe, those can also be called indigenous peoples. Uh, the, the feature we're looking at uh, with the Nuxalk is uh, potlatch culture. Uh, this is the element that makes them relevant to talking about economies. Uh, potlatch is a form of redistribution involving competitive feasting and dance practiced among uh, in Northwest Coast of uh, by Native Americans or more accurately uh, by First Nations people. So we're uh, this group, these groups of people um, are the traditional um, Northwestern uh, Native American slash uh, First Nations people. Uh, these are people, the people uh, that are most known for totem poles, for example. Uh, they had these boats, uh, they had a large boat culture and this general kind of style. You see it in uh, the logo of the Seattle Seahawks, for example. Um, one thing I, I just, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with, this is a, considered to be a pretty accurate depiction of the beginning of the potlatch where 
they uh, get on these big long boats and there's a you see this eagle right here and there's a bear back here too these are people dressed up in these costumes um i'm fascinated by this image because if they super seriously uh it was probably a religious person or a shaman like evoking the spirit of the eagle or whatever and that was probably a really intense kind of thing to be a part of and really fascinating and they would go up the river like announcing the potlatch or if they did it as kind of a serious but fun thing right you could imagine being the guy dressed up like an eagle going like caw, caw, uh just like having a whole heck of a lot of fun with it either way like i would just i would kill to be able to uh be involved with that sort of thing uh, a note, so the key to the potlatch is, the whole point of it is the person throwing the potlatch is trying to show that they are super, super, super generous, right? And if you throw a potlatch, um, you, you are a person of high standing in a community, right? You have the resources to be able to dispense it like that. Um, the Vikings and other Northern European cultures did have that same kind of concept too. They did have that sort of feasting and throwing a feast because if you're a big important person, then you threw feasts. Uh, and if you were a big important person, if you were a leader in your community in these, uh, these areas, and you didn't, and you hoarded your, your stuff all for yourself, you were seen as being a bad person. And that being seen as being a bad person in pre-modern societies makes a big, big difference. Um, another thing to be pointed out is that the potlatch was made illegal by the British slash Canadian government in the 1930s. Uh, it was during this era, uh, remember, the 1930s was the World War II era. Uh, in all likelihood, it was made illegal because it was seen as being wasteful, because everything was being directed at the war effort. Um, it should be pointed out that Canada was not fully independent from the UK until 1982. Uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of strange to think that Canadian independence didn't fully happen until then. Uh, Canadian history is also very interesting. Anyway, um, let's move into the documentary. So uh, I am going to open up uh, the uh, text scroll so I can see it a little easier, uh, but I am going to uh, show this and share this. If we crap out, right, like we did with the, the first time we tried to show the movie, uh, we will uh, just, uh, I will have you watch this video um, on your own, but I do want us to watch it together uh, just so we can uh, have uh, some of that give and take and I can comment on stuff if necessary. Let me just get things rolling here. So if you could give me a thumbs up if you see the YouTube. Good, thank you, Nicholas. Oh, wait, that's the wrong, that's the wrong point. Okay. Okay, let's put this to the beginning. One thing I think that is really neat about this document is that it's about a young person going to find her heritage and to find her roots and what it means to uh, be, what, what it means to find, find your heritage, right? And I, I, I think as individuals, that's super important for us. If we have the capacity to find that stuff, then we, we should be able to do it. Uh, additionally, um, she, if, she appears to be, if you look at her, she, she looked like your standard uh, white person, right? And what does that racial component mean for her? That's also something that's uh, very interesting. Um, 
So yeah, here's this and uh, check her out. And uh, I'm also gonna uh, tell me if it gets too choppy too in the discussion. I would appreciate that. Oh, I need to share the volume. One second, guys. I need to redo the share to share the volume. I already did, uh, you guys can still hear me. I already did post the link. Uh, it is in uh, the uh, PowerPoint, but I will post it uh, on an announcement as well. That's a good question. Okay, uh, here we go. To celebrate and visit, but right now my heart is racing and I'm scared. I believe my culture is dying. Our elders are passing away and with them our language and knowledge. I'm taking my first steps onto an unknown road and all I can think of is, what am I doing? What can I possibly do? Culture may look strong, but there are gaps in our knowledge. We don't know if we're doing it right. My name is Lindsay May Willie. I grew up with my mom and sister away from Kingcom Inlet, where my dad and his side of the family lived. He was my kindred spirit, and I always visited him. As a little kid, I remember being struck by how safe and calm I felt with him. I was 15 when he died in a riverboat accident with my uncle Ernie. My whole world went black. I've always heard rumors that certain things in the potlatch are done wrong, and now our elders are saying it's my generation's turn to step up and learn to throw one. So I'm leaving my life in Vancouver behind. Two sisters and my cousins Jesse and Julia feel the same urgency I do. Our separate paths have brought us together to Kingcom to discover a common trail full of laughter, heartbreak, and everything in between. I always thought going to Kingcom would be good for me. And I have a strong urge to protect what we still do have. We are the Muskogmau Daudin, a tribe within the Kwakwakiwak Nation on the west coast of Canada. We have been a part of the Kingcom Valley for over 10,000 years. Our potlatch ceremony is the keystone to our identity. It's a celebration where we come together as a family to perform our songs, dances, name babies, and conduct rites of passage. Our ceremonies are where our existence began. In our creation story, two wolf brothers, Kawadili Kla and his younger brother Kulili, came down from the north with their families and over time spread down the Kinkum Valley. Kawadili Kla is the ancestor of my people, the Zawadeno. Over time, our family spread out over Canada, but those of us who descend from my grandparents, Charles and Emily Willie, have come together for a family reunion to talk about what we're doing wrong within our potlatch. I'm excited to learn about our people's history and how it connects to our ceremonies. Really hoping that we have a learning experience this We are taking part in a week-long workshop that my cousins Mike and Marianne are putting on to prepare us for our upcoming potlatch. Okay, guys. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, it looks like it is still pretty choppy on your end. It's relatively smooth on my end. Uh, if it isn't choppy for you, you're welcome to stay and keep watching. I'm going to keep playing it, um, but just be sure to watch it on the link that I'm going to post on Blackboard in a few minutes. Uh, before I really, uh, before our mass exodus, uh, does anyone have any questions on anything for the course? No. Okay, if you would like to leave at this time, you can. Uh, I am going to keep playing the video if you happen to actually have a good feed. Okay, thank you for helping.
Along with my cousin Ryan, these two have traveled the globe gathering information and stories from museums for about 12 years now. They have brought what they've discovered back, back to us and are going to fill in some of the missing holes we have in our knowledge. It was so important for us to learn what happened to our people, right? Um, Pre-contact and the when the residential school came into play and how a lot of our history became distorted and now we're stuck with trying to piece everything together. My cousin Julia has answered our elders' call. She's moved home to Kingcom to live with her grandma, my Auntie Bobby, jumping head first into a culture she's been a stranger to. Julia? Mm -hmm. As she's been a breath of fresh air, you know, it's been really nice to have her here. I know the community is awed by her energy. I marvel at all the things she does. It's hard for me to identify as an indigenous person, partly because I didn't grow up in Kingcom and partly just because, well, just so damn white. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel good about myself when I'm out here, and I think that land does give you that because I don't know why, <laughs> but it's just there. It's the night before the workshop begins, and I've been asked to tell my family about my project. The idea of the documentary is us as youth stepping up to take that knowledge and, and, and carrying it on. Um, carrying on our culture. To me, myself, it's an invasion of privacy when you're filming a group of people eating. Lindsay is our family member. I trust her implicitly that she's not going to be abusing the information that she provides in product. I don't understand why they're filming now when we're discussing whether they should be filming or not. This is filming the raw emotion of our family, and then someone else is going to own that. But I want to know that we have control over that. It doesn't just go out into the world. And this is what Lindsay wants to capture, the controversy, the, the struggle, and then at the end, we come out at the end stronger. I'm actually afraid that I'm going to witness the death of my culture, and, and, and I want to tell this story because it means a lot to me to to be a part of this rebirth. Like we are actually start like we're being reborn right now. I hope it's gonna be beautiful and, and I wish that you would be a part of it because I love you all and you're a part of me and, and I wanna be a part of you too. I didn't know I was walking into my family in such a vulnerable state. To not have my whole family supporting me made me feel more like an outsider than ever. What information was coming that would make them react like this? I thought I came here to tell a story. We young people and next year, we would have successfully pulled one off. We would have saved our culture. The end. I would like to explore what it means to be a mama. But that's not what's happening. The information about to be revealed was nothing I ever expected. The Mi'kmaq are actually the fundamental social unit of our people. Marianne agreed to let the camera in for half an hour while she talked about subjects she was comfortable sharing with the world. I took notes so I could ask her what I wanted to know later in an interview. A few people could remember very vaguely references to the Namima, but when it came down to our generation, for the most part, it had been forgotten. This is the moment when everything changed for me. We learned our potlatch doesn't resemble its traditional self at all. First of all, it's not even called a potlatch. We had separate ceremonies with their own names. And second, it was based on a forgotten social system I had never even heard of. An Amima is a, like a family group or a clan. So the main political structure, governance structure, social structure for the Kwa Kwa Kiwa is based on the Namima structure. So each tribe has a number of Namima. To throw a proper potlatch, our family would have to reconstruct the system, 
Not only would we have to, but the whole Kwakwakiwak Nation has to buy into it because we need their support and participation as witnesses. But before this happens, our first step is to understand our immediate family history and the roles we used to play. Lots of our people have grown up away from Kingcom. Along with her sisters and dad, my cousin Jessie is looking to redefine herself. This is only my fourth time, I think, ever coming home to the village, actually. Um, it's only ever been during potlatches, which are always, you know, big, busy, hectic, <laughs> hectic times, so I feel like I don't know or have a bunch of a real connection here. <laughs> Jessie followed her sister Julia to Kingcom for the summer. She's looking not only to connect to her roots, but to herself as well. She wants to know what it means to be Zawadeno and what role she can play in our family's effort. Mike hopes that more young people like us will get on board with researching and spreading the word of what we're learning. I hope it provides balance for not only our family, but hopefully other families and, and a structure to, to follow again because there was a structure. So what happened to us to make our whole social structure collapse? In 1885, the Canadian government made it illegal for us to practice our culture. They banned the potlatch. We were persecuted for that. We were sent to jail for it. And they took that away. They stripped that off of us. And so it lessens you as a human being. The man who stripped us was William Halliday, an Indian agent. He kind of made it his personal mission to, to shut this thing down. In 1921, was able to have quite a number of people incarcerated. Marianne's mom, my auntie Glo, was a child when the ban was active. She remembers the fear she felt during that time. What stayed with you more as a child, though you may not have understood what was really happening, you felt we always do. You know, if things aren't right, we feel it. We may not understand it or the reason for it, but we feel it. She remembers the time the police came. And I can remember exactly where we were sitting in the big house at the time, when the word must have, you know, come from whoever was on guard. There was a boat coming. <laughs> Everyone got up, went home. The men stayed behind to take care of all the, the regalia and that. And take any evidence that there was a, a, a potlatch happening. And I used to wonder why this happened. And then he made a deal with people who were facing jail sentences that if they gave up their masks and potlatch paraphernalia, that uh, he would give them suspended sentences. When the ban was lifted, our people tried to revitalize our ceremonies. Our ancient knowledge was left in a fractured state. The new potlatch that emerged is unrecognizable because it was condensed. And our songs and dances are no longer taken from a specific namima, but from all over. I feel like now I'm looking at a Frankenstein um, potlatch. There's gonna be lots of pushback because you know, you get, kind of get complacent in the way things work and people aren't always so keen on the change. God, I feel this um, fear. Spirits and the ancestors are angry at us. But hearing that, I don't see how they can be angry because it's not our fault. It's these huge forces that work working against, against us. If we decide to go back to the complex Namima system, this could affect the head of our family, my uncle Don, and the name that he holds. With it comes a seat within the Namima and potlatch structure. And under it, our treasure box filled with all of our family dances, songs, names, and other rites that give us our identity within our people. The name came to him after the knowledge of how names were passed down was lost. Now his name could possibly go to someone else. It's not on the table because it's been in our family for the longest time. We're the ones that have been taking care of that, that treasure box. It would be really hard for me in per personally to give that up and this your dad got this i have fond memories of going to potlatches with my dad i remember the masks coming to life and i would hide behind him 
Even as an adult, I always left them with such a spiritual high. If they're not being conducted right, does this mean what I saw and felt wasn't real? At the end of our week together, my family decided to stop our potlatch. At least until we know we are ready. Now I feel like a part of my identity is gone. Julia grew up with her mom's side of the family, far away from Kingcom. Well, I was born in Whitehorse, Yukon, uh, but moved when I was four to Yellowknife Northwest Territories. Grew up in a very white, privileged household. When I went to Trout Lake to tan moose hides, I really realized how important knowing where you come from is. Being exposed to that really made me realize what I had been missing since being here. I definitely do have a strong respect for that belief, believing in a higher power. I've experienced it, just being out by myself, walking up to the campgrounds, hanging out by the river. It's a place that really has, holds lots of power as soon as you go there. You can, you can just feel it. And I feel like I've learned more of being here than I did at the two years I was at school for. Be feasting tonight. <laughs> Straight after finishing an environmental studies program, she came to Kingcom for a job with the Muskmaug Zawadeno Tribal Council to work with elders and learn culture on the job. No one recognized me when I first got here. Like, I took the plane with Auntie Liz. She didn't recognize me, and I kind of had to introduce myself. Like, I feel since I've been so uninvolved in the culture aspect, I felt that would definitely set me apart from everyone. So I was really worried about that. What do you feel is the most important thing that we should be focusing on or that needs to be brought back? Well, probably the biggest thing is the language. And that's the scary part because even the elders that we have today, to me, aren't elders in the sense that they know our way of life because they didn't. They were, they were products of the residential school. But it's hard, too, because we're always told to trust in what the elders say, but now with what Marianne and Mike are and Ryan are saying is they have some things wrong. Yeah, they were saying that there is shame in not knowing, so people will start to make it up. So it's, it's not an easy road to travel, and knowing that there's such gaps everywhere. You also have to look in tandem at the wellness of everyone. If you're not well, you're, you, you don't have a clear path. You're not going to move ahead in life because you're, you're still so full of pain. And, you know, I have a brother who, you know, if you hear his residential school stories, horrible. You know, him and Frank went through a real hard time. Because of our, the abuse that we took in residential school, it's hard to trust people, but also it's really hard to learn how to be affectionate again. My dad and his siblings were taken from their parents and placed at St. Michael's Residential School in Alert Bay. I had really good memories of uh, how we were in the village and how safe we were. Um, it wasn't until we went to St. Mike's that I even got a inkling that there were such things as violence. So we were known by our numbers rather than our name. You know, they basically took away your identity on day one. Being taught, you know, that the old Indian ways, that's what they called it, that the old Indian ways were wrong. A lot of our, our people left the residence school with that. They had been indoctrinated to follow orders. Then what residential school did was take all that. They took away Colladella Club and replaced them with Jesus or whatever. Elders are passing away. They're 70, 75 years old now, and they're which with them.
doing it right. <laughs> I know, it's so soft. Emotional well-being. She's been living in Victoria working as a youth intern for the government. She has created her... work placement here in Kingcombe where she's getting the community together. To learn cultural activities. When was coming in, I expected that I would be doing workshops, uh, you know, every night. It would happen on a regular basis, on time. You know, it would just go all nice and smooth and perfect. And it's something completely different. And I just learned, like, had to just reevaluate on every level what I was hoping to do and achieve. Good morning, Kingcom. This is to let everyone know that we're planning a camping trip this weekend. That's like, I had these expectations in term and when I moved to Kingcom that it would happen much more naturally and much more quickly, that I would feel better and that I would feel more connected. So it hasn't happened yet as much as I had hoped. And it's been a month. Maybe it's not my thing. <laughs> like, I don't know if you can say, like, your culture is not your thing or your culture is your thing, but... It sounds like you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. <laughs> I always do. Yeah. I always do. To soothe my grief when I lost my dad, I had become a fundamentalist Christian for a time. This worried my mom and sister because it pulled me away from who I was. I know when your dad passed, a part of you went away. It was pretty traumatic. Maybe that's how you could only survive is by cutting off from everybody. It was how I dealt with that grief. And it made me want to live again. The pain of losing my dad made me walk away from my culture and my family. My Uncle Don was the one to bring me back. He wanted to give me my dad's name and dance. I said no at first, but when he told me it would go to someone else, I couldn't turn my back on my dad. The dance came from my great-grandpa Toby Willie in a time when spirituality and healing were still a part of our ceremonies. He was a shaman. The mamakka takes people's negative energy away and gives it to the earth. It's come down the line to me in a time when spirituality has only traces left. When I did my dance, something changed in me. Did you notice the tra transformation when I came out? Mm -hmm. It was you. Mm. It was absolutely unbelievable when you came out and did, did it. I had never heard you sing like that, ever. The dance has become a part of who I am. To do my part for our potlatch, I want to learn everything I can about it. I've been told that if you really know your dance and the words of the song, it will have power. My cousin Bobby and I are visiting my grandmother's brother, Uncle Ernie. Do you mind if I set up this he there? has the same type of dance I do. This is a home video of my dad doing the mamakka. I learned the dance by watching it in my living room and practiced around my coffee table. I'm not allowed to show you it because it's sacred and meant only for those physically present. What does it mean when, when you turn? There's nothing to explain. There's nothing to explain. You just watch how, how the dancer is, what the dancer is doing. And one of the terrible things that are happening now, 
that people are not following in our forefathers footsteps but I want to what do I do you probably the only one so when you when you look at me who's trying to do you learn do you feel like oh there's no point because it's dead anyways well, is, is like it I is said, it dead if, uh, if, if you try that you're just gonna argue with people you want to prove something by yourself who's gonna back you up who in the family how are you gonna get a chance to dance again is it look at what's happening yeah we know like I know that I, I want to reverse it you don't think it's possible? Well, I guess you might say it's not not for me to say. I just felt so weird because I wanted to go in there and... To see my uncle without hope made me understand that to him, the potlatch is dead. He has seen it change so much over time that he doesn't recognize it anymore. If he doesn't have answers for me, then where will I get them? has made us realize that we came here with huge expectations. We thought we needed to know the details of potlatching, but we're working against time and a broken nation. To learn our culture, we're going up against the aftermath of residential school and what has left us. In our little village, I've seen depression, suicide, sexual, drug, and alcohol abuse. My people's spirits are broken, and we've inherited the pieces. My dad and his siblings sacrificed their lives to get us to where we are today. We are free to learn now. My aunties and uncles may still be hurting, but I see resilience in the steps they're taking to bring our family back together. When my uncle Ernie passed away, his name went down to my uncle Don, who didn't expect it. I didn't hold enough knowledge to be able to lead at that time. So I had to seek out knowledge do I question who my leaders about my leadership? I do. But he accepted it and moved home to Kingcom to be that leader for us. When he steps out of his pain and becomes that leader, he's awesome and people listen to him. Every time that we have an event, I feel that I have grown. My Auntie Bobby has also moved home. She recognizes the effects residential school is still having on our family and she wants it addressed. The family ties where you're, to you're tight as a family have just disappeared because of our distance. And that still has to be worked on to pull us together. She sees our communication as a family has disappeared and is working to get us together. And that's a big issue in our families because we pass that on to our children and their children now pass it to the grandkids. How you doing, Bobby? And it's really unfortunate because communications is, you know, the basis of uh, relationships. We need to meet with our family to talk about my uncle's name and what we want to do with our treasure box. My uncle's cousin is a potential name holder. I'm willing to talk about it with any of our family, and that's why we want to meet with all of our family. But I'm not willing to say, oh, I'm going to do this right now. we go for a I uh, know he's been in the city all of his life. If, it, if something went over to him, would he be active with it? Or would it just be dormant and all he wants it for is to be called chief? Even though there's so much work for our family, I see that our generation is giving them a light at the end of the tunnel. I feel you really can't stop because we have these future generations to care about. I want that for them. You know, I had my granddaughter here this summer and my grandson, and I was really, really happy about that. And if continuing our traditional way of life and the practices and ceremonies and that is, is going to help to further define it down the road, then I really want to see that happen. My granddaughter is really special to me. She just loves me unconditionally. And, you know, she comes up and hugs you, you're affectionate, and you can't help but be affectionate back. Jesse is struggling. 
to find an identity within our people. One of the most challenging components of attaining any kind of sense, proper sense of self as a, as a Zadina person um, is the cornerstone of spirituality. Kind of, I was raised Anglican-ish. I was baptized, we went to church. At a very early age, I kind of dismissed all of that and went for a very atheistic point, like perspective on, on life. And I've kind of held that uh, ever since I was about 10 or 11 years old. So more than half of my life, I've adamantly believed that there's no, there's no spirit or soul or higher power. But the more I learn about like our traditional laws and values and, and, and potlatching and, and our traditions, there's such a huge aspect of, of spirituality that I just don't know if I'm ready to embrace. But she has found a place and a part she can play. She is connecting to the land. I'm a huge like, believer in eating locally. How that connects you to the place that you're in in a way that being somewhere or knowing about somewhere like can't. In this way, when you eat these foods, you're like eating kingdom. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's a way of like you know building yourself using like parts of the land. I think not everything's going to turn around immediately, but if you put work and care into things, that you end up with really delicious results. Foods, results. <laughs> yeah, really delicious, delicious results. Delicious results. I've been told not to pursue my dance, but I found an uncle who will give me answers. My uncle Paul works with energy like our old people used to. I want to know about how my dance uses energy to heal. I've known for a long time that you are very strong. You're a healer. You are your dance, Amyachid. But it's about your own spiritual evolution that needs to be addressed. I can talk to you about it, but until you experience it, those to me would be just work. Take 15 minutes a day just be quiet by yourself. Mamaka is about how do you harness this, the energies of the crystal? And so that's what you need to do is tune in with the, the energies of a crystal. How do I do that? Like, do I just hold one? Like, I have no idea where to go for that. Okay. Uh, it's your sweetheart. My dance comes from the legend of when Kawadili Kla and Kulili played with their power. It was in crystal form. Just allow it to experience what you need to experience with it. And learn patience, because you want answers right away. My Uncle Paul didn't give me the answer I was expecting, but he helped me understand that expectation is what's keeping me from asking the right questions. Jessie is finally getting a workshop off the ground. Her family has been invited to a neighboring community's potlatch, so they're practicing a ladies' dance. Anytime that I've danced in a potlatch, it's always been almost like last minute and just like someone pointing at me and calling me down to the back room and, you know, dressing me up and then being like, told go. And so it's always like been that. like a terrifying experience. When you're dancing, it's like when your spirit comes alive. So if you feel some sort of movement, then just, just do that. As to like dancing and being in the big house and, and big house uh, protocol, I haven't been a part of that yet. Since learning what we learned during our family meetings, I'm feeling a little apprehensive about going to a potlatch. I'm worried that I'll look at it in a different way and that the power it used to have won't be there. I'm grateful for Jesse and Julia. They haven't been to as many potlatches and it's hard not to feel their excitement. Even though we're not doing our potlatch, we're contributing an important role to another family. We will be witnessing their ceremonies. What you are really saying is that you are a member of a group. Our traditions, they were the actual enactment and reinforcement of who we were and our histories um, played out on the floor so that the other Namimas, the other tribes, could see us and verify that, yes, this is your story and it had, this is how it fits into the whole. 
The majority of the Kwakwakiwak communities were abandoned due to disease and pressure from the government and economy. Sadzi's new comet was rebuilt in 2001 by Bill Glendale, who invited us to his potlatch. Since then, the community has grown. It's all f so new to me, in a way. I feel like I feel like a, a child, and I'm trying to just be like, just be curious and be open, because it's it's a completely foreign world to me. Even if it's being done in a way that traditionally it wasn't done. I mean, I just think that there's so much meaning for me um, just in, in the process that we're, that we're, we're going to witness. The songs are very powerful if you know the, the language. If you dance the way it's supposed to be danced because you know the words, and you know the different ways you hold your hands and why you do it. If you understand all of that, then it's very powerful. All the spiritual aspect of the potlatch is kind of done within the cedar bark ceremony. Um, and so I, I didn't know that at all. So, I mean, I'm coming away with more, more knowledge. Instead of being scared and being out there, I was able to just really just dance. Instead of having like timid dancers, you have confident dancers, and that will help people experience the potlatch like used to be, like really entering into the spirit world. Like, you know, just learning that when you do that turn, like I never knew this before, my grandma told me, but when you do that turn onto the floor, you're turning into the spirit world. Like I notice when dancers dance and they really know it and they're, they're dancing with their spirit, it allows my spirit to come out. Mm -hmm. Like what about you, like have you, had any experiences in there? Uh, not ones like where I was completely like, I don't know, taken away. But yeah, you could, you could start to feel it. It starts to get there. My cousin Bobby practices energy healing, not seen since my grandpa Toby's day. We do the dance and some of us are just doing the motion. But some of us do the motion, but they can feel the energy of the dance. I have always wondered if our ancestors are still here for us, or if we're doing this on our own. Bobby has been seeing them and they've been speaking to her. They always tell me it's that easy and that we're, we've always been there. <laughs> I'm trusting that they've always been there. Well, why didn't you show me a sign? Yeah, I mean, come on. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Waiting. Something. <laughs> and maybe we just didn't see it. Maybe they was there all the time. But you do have to take it upon yourself. No one, like I've learned, I guess hopefully when I went to Kingham that, you know, knowledge would just fall into my lap because, you know, you're in the motherland, but you still have to search it out. It's not gonna just come to you. With anything, with the language, dancing, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, they say. Well, I've been bugging Okawakis for a long time yeah. now. You would, couldn't get away from me this time. <laughs> it's a small, small area. He can't get away anywhere. <laughs> I saw him get the sticks, and I'm like, oh. And then I was right behind him, and he looked behind him, and he's like, oh. <laughs> Trying to get away from you. <laughs> Not a chance, Uncle. So I was feeling like it was kind of almost hopeless, but I'm not seeing the bigger picture. I mean, they tried to, you know, kill it off, and they really, really tried to stop our culture. I didn't realize like, we were actually moving. I thought we were stuck. Yeah. But we are moving, and like everyone, even it's it's like a slow crawl, though. Well, just this this village itself is 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 just goes to show how far people have come. Like, there was no one living here yeah. before, and they rebuilt it. And look at it now, it's gorgeous. A potlatch is happening here <laughs> in a big house. After being a central community member for over a year, Julia is running out of gas. She's leaving Kingcom for school. There's a lot of work to do and she's one of the few who's taken it on. She feels the weight of the burden. I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm overwhelmed with it. So maybe I'm one of those people who just gives up. I don't know. I am hungry. 
Yeah, there does need to be better communication. I don't know, and some better guidance for people like upcoming who want to get into this. Like, I still feel uncomfortable just from being such an outsider before, just coming in and, you know, trying to act like this stuff is mine. You know, like I have a right to it, so I still battle with that and then battle with it just you know, finding the right teachers. Even like following Uncle Wackus around, like I just feel like, why am I doing this? You kind of paved the way to come here for me and Jesse. What do you think we need to do for each other? Because I feel the same way. Like if you leave, I'm like, well, like who's gonna help me? Like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what am I supposed to do by myself here if you leave? I still have the thought in my mind now that I, I will be back here. Uh, the reason why I want to go get an education is so that I can come back here with a better knowledge base on how to protect the land. Once I got past all the, the frustration and anxiety and despair that I was feeling, I just, I feel really good here. I love learning and there's so much here that's a part of me intrin like intrinsically. It's just like, it's, what, a, what a waste to not embrace it. It doesn't all have to happen in three months that it's going to be a lifelong process. You know, it's going to be another 27 years before I, you know, feel caught up completely that uh, by accepting that it's just kind of like, <sighs> I'm used to a culture where to know anything you have to go to a university and learn a subject within a few highly intensive months. This is how I've been approaching my learning here, very intellectually. So it's frustrating now to be told just to let it come to me. Since last time we talked, yes. I've been just noticing my crystal. Yes. And I don't know, I don't really notice anything yet. I keep waiting for something profound to happen. Oh, you're or... looking for profundity. Remember we talked about how you block yourself by either judging yourself or people judge, uh, perceive judging you? Yeah. Your thought is one of the greatest creations. It's a energy, your thought is energy. But it's your mind that creates that thought. But they are both energy. So I would ask you just to lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning from my uncle that the anxiety I feel when I don't get my answers right away is blocking me from what is already present, my spirit. I'm approaching it with my intellect when what I'm after is something spiritual. I've never really sat and experienced what is present, so I have to let go of that way of learning. It turns out I've overlooked my answer. If I really, really want to know it, I'm going to have to connect to that energy, which I don't know. I can't do that. But when you danced the dance, you danced. Did you feel the energy? Yes. So, there it is. <laughs> well. Respect yourself and, and have faith in your spirit. Because whatever you need in your life is within you. Whatever we need to know because we do have spirit guides and you have to believe in them. Through their research, my cousins have uncovered a forgotten ceremony, the Gachalitzo. They recently brought it back to our community. Having a coming of age ceremony for a young girl, that's recognizing an extreme time in the person's life and being like, hey, you're still a part of our community. You're still a part of our family and we're here for you. And I cannot wait to see how, what kind of strong and empowered people they grew up to be because they're growing up knowing that they have this, right? Like these things that I've been looking for for so long, they're kind of like told at such a young age that you, your home is here, you belong here, you have this support, you have this love. And you have this culture that we're actively practicing. This ceremony is a little piece of the ceremonies we used to have. It's not our potlatch, but it's something we can do right now with integrity. We are rebuilding slowly. 
I truly believe that if we trust in spirits of our ancestors, we're never going to die out. But we didn't save our culture. Neither of us expected to be met with such opposition or resistance. <laughs> but we now know that our culture can't be something we can conquer in such a short time period. It isn't a subject at school we can memorize. Something much greater. It's a way of living, a way to understand and respect the world. With our cousin Thomas, we decided to hike up the river where our ancestors descended from. We hoped to find traces of them. We got to know the land a little bit more. It is alive and dangerous. On our sixth day when we were flooded out, we finally understood our ancestors must have really respected and observed our valley with such detail in order to survive. Unloaded, right? Every part of our culture celebrates this relationship. To truly appreciate this makes me feel closer to them and to our potlatch. We've been prepared for a lifelong journey. Okay, thanks for being with everyone. Um, that is it for this evening. Thank you for putting up with all the tech issues. Um, I will see you next week. Right. See ya. Bye.